There is an opportunity to type your question in YouTube platform. These and many other issues will be discussed in both in Lithuanian and in English. So you can write your question in Lithuanian and it will be translated. And if you will write it in English, it will also will achieve our lectures. So I would love to start with Frankfurt to the Free Society Institute and as well as Seamus Group of a Family for organization of this conference. Now, I want to introduce a long-standing politician, a person who has been fighting for natural rights and freedom since the first day of this movement. She's a former vice president of Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, Parliamentary Assembly, a former chair of a Parliamentary Commission on the Family and Child Affairs. Finally, a member of a parliament of the Republic of Lithuania and chairwoman of the Seamus Group for the Family, Mrs. Vilia Alaknaita Abramik. Labai ačiū užsuteikta žodė ir užgalimybę pasveikinti mūsų konferencijos dalyvės. Thank you for giving me the floor. Thank you for uh, this honor uh, uh, to participate at this important conference. I would like uh, to thank you on behalf of uh, the Lithuanian Republic Seimas Parliament uh, members group for uh, the family. I would like to welcome uh, the speakers uh, who are exclusive. These are the representatives of the academic world uh, who have uh, uh, contributed a lot in in the area of policy, sociology, philosophy, and uh, law, and uh, have written many um, scientific publications, books, and monographies, and uh, are worldwide known. And uh, thank you very much for this honor um, to see you here at this conference. Today, we have gathered here, as is usual, remotely, geographically. We are very remote uh, from each other because the member states which uh, uh, the, the speakers are from are uh, really remote. That is the UK, uh, the uh, neighborly po Polish, uh, Poland, uh, the US. But all of us actually today care about about one joint concern, that is the concern about the biological family of man and woman, parents and children, uh, because and it's uh, remaining its destiny in our epoch because it's the family that determines so many things because it's the cradle of life uh, which actually raises uh, the future of uh, all the nations and humanity and. Uh, uh, the natural complementarity of man and woman is the basis of the family and it has always been primary to all powers and states. It has survived all civilizations and uh, millennia. And uh, for this reason, Oh, okay. Oh, problems with the, uh, with the Zoom platform. Something. Sometimes it happens. Sorry for that. Uh, I would love to introduce our next speaker, our mm, friend, and uh, I think one of the most 
significant public intellectuals when we are talking about religious liberty, when we are talking about religious freedom, as well as family questions. Oh. This person is a professor at Vitotas Magnus University, as well as, well as uh, former um, chairman of uh, the future uh, uh, federation. This uh, person is Mr. Bigantas Malinauskas. Could you share some thoughts on this conference, please? Thank you very much, Audris and uh, Achush. Thank you very much for an excellent pre presentation for the introduction. And uh, on my behalf, I would like to thank everyone um, for inviting me uh, to this conference and to welcome all the participants to this conference. Today, we have been talking about freedom more than ever, but more specifically, we concentrate on the fact that uh, the free uh, society is the society that cherishes the values uh, of um, uh, the society. And one of those values without which uh, the lasting um, future of the family is not possible is the family. Uh, the family is uh, uh, the natural and main cell of uh, the society and has the right uh, to the protection by the state. And it's uh, the same is being said by Article 38 of the Constitution of the Republic of Lithuania, which says that family is uh, the foundation of uh, the state. The family is uh, the, uh, the main cell of uh, the society, not because the hum that the Human Rights Declaration or the Constitution of the Republic of Lithuania has stated that it is, but but because it has all the critical qualities and uh, the uh, human nature actually uh, boasts the qualities that um, ensure the lasting value of uh, the family. However, today's society experiences the pressure on um, the ideological pre pressure, the pressure of various uh, ideological groups uh, to uh, uh, deny, uh, to abandon the uh, family construct. And therefore we have the natural question whether the society and the state can change the foundation of its own without bearing the consequences and what uh, and what will be the consequences of the social and legal experiment for the future of the whole uh, Europe. And uh, I'm delighted that we have the right today to hear these insights and ideas at this conference, uh, which will probably uh, have um, uh, the the impact on the choices made uh, in Lithuania and Europe and I'm especially delighted uh, to hear the well-known world famous academics philosophers uh, lawyers and intellectuals from the various countries I would especially like to thank uh, conference uh, uh, speakers, Professor uh, Mazurkevich, uh, Professor Schlachta, uh, Professor Jokubaitis, Paul Coleman, and uh, Julius uh, Rudevskis. I also thank the SEMAS group uh, uh, for family that uh, have actually in initiated this conference. And I would like to wish you a productive time during this conference. Listeners today on behalf of the Free Society Institute. And I would like to extend a special thanks and greetings and gratitude to the speakers of today's conference, Professor Bogdan Schlachta, Professor Piotr Mazurkevich, Professor Elvidas Jokubaitis, Katie Faust, Paul Coleman, and Yuri Rudevskis, uh, who agreed to share their insights and thoughts with us today. I wish to all of us a good, interesting, and intellectually enriching time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vikantas, for such insightful beginning. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Vilja Alaknaita is uh, together with us one again. So please uh, continue your speech. Uh, thank you. 
we see that uh, uh, in this world we experience not only the evil but also uh, the, the good but also the evil powers i don't know what happened but actually uh, where i uh, stopped uh, nowadays we speak a lot about uh, different types of families about the variety of families partnerships and uh, the, uh, different types of marriages but uh, the marriage is not a simple legal construct that can be changed uh, on the political um, order uh, the um, uh, family rights charter says that uh, the uh, marriage is the natural institution which actually means that neither the state nor the legislator uh, should not and cannot feel as a demiage the creator uh, able to recreate the world uh, refuting and uh, undermining the traditions irrespectively of the fact that it's under the flag of progress as has the history shown actually contains in itself a lot of demolition power therefore uh, we risk less uh, when we actually are uh, on the front of uh, the, the human nature and tradition rather than fashionable slogans and we are sorry the sound has disappeared again Todėl, kaip sako Skrūtonas, kaip sakė, nes šis garbus anglų filosofas jau palikęs yra mus, tradicijoje atsispindi ir svarbiausi klausimai, jiems žinosius žmonijos klausimus. Tradicijoje atsispindi svarbiausi atsakymai į amžinosius klausimus. Žinoma, buvo tokia ideologinė daina, kuri ragino išardyti pasaulį iš pačių pamatų, Ir tą pasaulį vėl iš naujo pastatyti, šalin tradiciją, šalin prietarus. Šita komunistinio internacionalo melodija net ir mano kartos atmintyje dar skamba, mes ją prisimename. Tačiau pasiekmės šios dainos ir šios ideologijos buvo tokios skaudžios lietuvių tautai ir visoms regiono tautoms, kad pakartoti to jokia forma. Net ir užmaskuotą formą, niekuomet nenorėčiau ir niekam nelinkėčiau. Noriu ir visiems linkiu gyventi laisvoje visuomenėje, kur tėvai auklėja savo vaikus pagal savo moralinius ir religinius įsitikinimus, kur jie posėlėja kultūrinės šeimos ir tautos vertybės, rūpinasi vaiko gerovę ir saugo... Where parents actually take care of the children and take care of the welfare of the family and uh, I would like to wish you to live in the society where families first of all supply support and uh, carry out uh, the role uh, of the giver of life and the first educator thank you Thank you a lot of for such insightful ideas. Atsižvelgiant į jų pobūdį ir prigimti. Taigi, nežalojant... Thinking into account the nature. So, this means that we should not infringe upon the main principles of societal life through laws, through political programs or institutional violence. The family charter which was proclaimed by the holy see in 1983 with the support of uh, john paul ii uh, says a lot about the family and the main idea is that family is a natural construct which exists before the state and which uh, has uh, inalienable rights so these are the thoughts of uh, um, Pope John Paul II, and we still feel his fatherly hand in Lithuania. And uh, today, well, despite the technical difficulties that we are experiencing, I believe that it is uh, him, the white pilgrim uh, and the apostle, John Paul II is the true inspirer uh, and true patron of our uh, conference. So let us all have strength and thank you for your attention. Thank you once again. Uh, and now we will have our first presentation.
Martin Mustafa Nijinsky University. Mr. Pyotr Mazurkiewicz is one of the most famous Polish academicians in the world. He was awarded the degree of a Habilitated Doctor in 2002 on the basis of his academic achievements in, 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 and the dissertation entitled Europeanization of Europe Culture Identity of Europe in the Context of Integration Process at the Institute of Political Sciences, the Polish Academy of Sciences. Nine, he accepted the academic title of Professor from the President of the Republic of Poland, Lech Kaczynski. He is a member of the Tiffin Council uh, of the Institute of Political Studies of Polish Academy and Science of Sciences. He is the editor in chief of the magazine Christianity World Politics. He was the director of the UK SW Institute of Political Science in the years 2019 to 2020. He was the dean of the Social of Economic Faculty of W. His academic interests are religious freedom. Catholic social for European affairs. So, Mr. Piotr Mozerkevich, please share your wisdom with us. Thank you very much for the invitation, and that's a, a great honor uh, for me to uh, <clears throat> be able to take a floor uh, in this gathering. Uh, the Charter of the Family Rights uh, was published, as it was said, in 1983. Uh, on an explicit recommendation of the uh, Synod on the Family in 1980, which was integrated by John Paul II in uh, uh, the Exhortation Familiaris Consortium. The first uh, draft of the Charter, which is addressed to uh, the heads of states, to international organizations, non-governmental organizations dealing with the family issues, was written in such a way uh, that it might become a part of the corpus of international human rights documents. Therefore, it mainly uses the language of natural law and contains uh, many references to the um, uh, uh, legal documents like uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, uh, like uh, uh, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights and uh, for example, the European Social Charter. The Charter of the Family Rights, together with a kind of Charter of the Rights of Nations, enclosed uh, in the statement of uh, John Paul II uh, in the, EU, the UN headquarters in 1995, was to supplement the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which from the very beginning the Church regarded as uh, referring to individualistic anthropology. The church has not questioned the catalog of rights contained therein, but uh, a one-sided approach, even the right to marry and found a family, is presented there only as an individual right. Meanwhile, as we know, at least from time of Aristotle, man is by nature a social being. He is born in the family community, he is brought up in the community, he lives in and works in the community, he speaks uh, always using a language of a concrete community. So in the charter, we are reading the rights of the person, even though they are expressed as rights of the individual, have a fundamental social dimension, which finds in an innate and vital expression in the family. Two of these communities, in the opinion of John Paul II, are natural. Besides family, that's also a nation, and consequently, they are subjects of uh, natural rights. The Charter of the Family Rights states that the family is a natural society, exists prior to the state or any other community, and possesses inherent rights which are inalienable. The family's uh, antecedents towards the state, uh, its more basic character than that of the state or society, means that the state and society should play a servant role toward the family, not the other way around. One of the main contemporary challenges in this area is the usurpation by the state power concerning the institution of marriage and family, which is quite common in the West. It's mainly about the attempts to legally redefine the institution of marriage and family. In the Charter of the Family Rights, we read, 
the family is based on marriage that intimate union of life in complementarity between a man and a woman, which is constituted in the freely contracting the public express indissoluble bond of matrimony and is open to the transmission of life. For example, in Article 12 of the Convention of Human Rights, we still read men and women have the right to marry and found a family. But already in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the words men and women disappeared. Thus, we read the right to marry and the right to found a family shall be granted in accordance with the national law governing the exercise of these rights. The official explanations is said that the wording of the article has been modernized to cover cases in which national legislation recognizes arrangements other than marriage or founding a family. What is important now in this declaration for us, I think, is um, the saying that this article neither prohibits nor imposes the granting of the status of marriage to unions between people of the same sex, which means any country is obliged to grant the status of marriage to unions between people of the same sex. This uh, is the, the um, understanding uh, of this uh, declaration um, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. The question may, may arise, why is the state or the EU not allowed to change or to modernize the definition of marriage and family? And the first answer is quite relatively simple because democratic power is inherently limited. Democracy by definition is a limited majority rule. Today, unfortunately, in many Western countries, democracy is transforming into a kind of unlimited and therefore absolutist rule. It may be parliamentary absolutism or judicial absolutism, depending on whether it is parliament or courts that claims unlimited power. But this change does not strengthen, but weakens democracy. Uh, if some agreed, no, with uh, the idea of power uh, inherently limited, the question arises, why this limit of democracy is put just here? Why democratic power cannot change the legal definition of marriage and family? And here comes the anthropological question. Jean Paul II, analyzing the collapse of communism, claimed that this system was built upon anthropological error. It seems to me that the West is now shifting away from classical anthropology towards an anthropological error analogous to materialist communism. In the long run, this may provoke similar consequences. First, it is about the transition from constraint to unconstrained anthropology. Uh, to say this in a religious language, it is about recognizing that man is not God, and therefore must accept the limits set by creator. Saying this in a secular language, the point is that there are limits in the world that are not established by humans. One must therefore recognize that certain things must never be done with a man. Kant formulated uh, this in a principle that uh, mm, Man should be always treated as an end in himself and never only as a mean. This uh, is strictly connected with the idea of primordial sin, which is saying that human history is accompanied by the evil, which cannot be eliminated just by institutional improvement. Secondly, it is about recognizing that man is a spiritual material being. He is not an angel because angels have no body. And he is not an animal because animals don't have an immortal soul. He is the third creature, as Charles Peggy put it. Today, the vast majority of scientists believe that they are materialists. They believe that God does not exist. They are convinced that of the veracity 
of the materialistic vision of evolution, and they consume on a daily basis the best commodities market can offer them. However, behind these daily choices are often unconsciously accepted beliefs that they may be inconsistent or even contradict with uh, openly made declaration. And uh, in this uh, gray zone of uh, some pre-philosophical elements uh, uh, thinking which uh, which is uh, uh, chosen unconsciously uh, if, uh, I would uh, uh, um, search for for what I am calling practic practically applied angelology uh, let me give uh, some examples of this kind of thinking in the area of computer science human enhancement and transhumanism a question arises not only about the possibility to upgrade humans, but uh, for example, by improving uh, the human genome, implement, implanting various types of microchips into the human brain or increase its efficiency, but uh, also about the possibility of transferring the content of the human brain to hard drives. That's an expression used by Habermas. This would not only grant that none of this intelligence of angels would be lost for future generations, but also, as some believe, would ensure human immortality, at least in electronic form or in the form of physical avatars. For death, as Yuval Harari declares, is only a temporary technical problem that we can uh, and should solve. And where there is no death, there is no need to bear children. So to all those who would like to upgrade humans or replace them by post human beings, the Charter of the Family Rights reminds respect for the dignity of human being excludes all experimental manipulation or exploitation of human embryo. All intervention into the genetic heritage of the human person that are not aimed at correcting anomalities constitute a violation of the right to badly integrity and contradict the good of the family. In other words, the human genome should be protected by all means in the face of various attempts to manipulate it. To be humans uh, means to have a body. When according to the Bible, God created woman, Adam was amazed saying, at least here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. His delight is strictly connected with reference to the body. He's not saying spirit from my spirit or intellect from my intellect. He's really delighted with the body of a woman. And it is always like this whenever a man falls in love. And uh, the beauty of a woman here is playing a vital role. Certainly, true love is not limited to bodily dimension. Uh, even if nowadays this kind of thinking about the relationship between a man and a woman is very popular. The growing commercialization of the female body means that a man who goes for a walk, for example, in a Dutch city, can buy a whole woman for a few minutes or only her uterus for a few months. Pornography, prostitution, or surrogacy present the female body as a simple sexual object, which one day can be replaced, replaced by dolls, offering uh, more sexual sensation than a real woman. The difference between a man and a woman is primarily of carnal nature. It is rooted in different construction of the body. This the similarity. Uh, was not established mainly for aesthetic reasons. Rather, it is aesthetic attractiveness that performs a certain function aimed at the possibility of realizing the fundamental purpose of this difference, the procreation of a child. Pagan philosopher Aristotle explained this in such words. By a male animal, we mean that which generates in another, and by a female, that which generates in itself. Sexual difference is possible to understand only in the context of offspring and the role that each sex is playing in giving life to a child. 
only in the context of procreation, the purposeful, purposefulness of the binary division of the human species can be fully explained. And here comes the problem of sterilization of sexual intercourse between a man and a woman due to the contraceptive pill, which fundamentally ch changed the perception and the uh, meaning of uh, human life. Uh, and uh, the child, as a natural consequence of having sex, has almost disappeared from the horizon. So what is the point of having sex? It seems that if we exclude the wish to dominate, there are still two acceptable ones. The experience of a community of persons united in love, which uh, called uh, John Paul II communio personarum, and the accompanying feeling of pleasure. In the case of humans, however, the essence of sexuality is not just experiencing uh, mm, uh, passing pleasure, but being open to the other as different. Uh, it is at first the openness to expose, then to the baby, and ultimately to God who enters the marriage act, giving a new human being that uh, um, what his parents cannot convey to him. That's the image and likeness to God. If pleasure is the goal, you end up with homosexuality, writes a judge. Because if you eliminate the prospect of a baby born, it's hard to understand why the evaluation of pleasure would depend on the sex of persons involved and not on the amount of pleasure experience. But uh, the anti-fertility rebellion is prior to contraceptive pill. After all, we had Malthusianism, which proclaimed the need to infertile sexual intercourse by proposing to delay the age of marriage and to spread the homosexual relations. We had Marxism, which interpreted female fertility as a kind of biological impairment of the female body. Engels believed that the subjugation of women is biologically conditioned and that it occurs primarily in the family was taken up by feminists. Fertility is a natural defect in the female body in a double sense, according to these feminist movements. It is a weakness that renders women at certain times unfit to participate in hunting and wars on an equal footing with men. Motherhood in the biological and social sense excludes the woman from the public sphere and condemns her to passivity, that is, to look after children. Uh, Jen Wetke Elstein argues that this kind of perception of motherhood, widespread in feminism, is rooted in Aristotelian prejudice on the difference uh, in the importance of private and public spheres in Greek polis. So, uh, uh, it, the triad, the marriage, pregnancy, motherhood, is becoming here a symbol of reproductive enslavement. And the liberation of a woman is understood primarily as a release from the burden of fertility through contraception and from motherhood through abortion, which is its natural consequence. Uh, motherhood did not deserve this brutal denigration writes French feminist Sylviane Agassinsky. The feminist promoted by, for example, Simone de Beauvoir was driven by the desire to erase the distinction between men and women. However, it was possible only at the cost of humiliating the femininity and masculinization of women. It proposed freedom and a sense of dignity at the price of diminishing the value of maternal qualities. The negative vision of femininity, according to Agassinsky, has its source in androcentric superstition. For there is no rational reason to regard a man's use of, of the stick and club as a transgression of animality and maternity as confinement in holy animal immanence. The negation of the value of sex difference and complementarity leads to the acceptance of masculinity 
as natural and neutral model of humanity, as a norm. And that's the recognition of femininity, as Plato already did, as the deviation from the norm due to, the, to a defect in nature. Therefore, in order to be truly human, a woman must resemble a man as much as possible. Hence, it is only a step to aversion of femininity itself. The concept of femininity is also a link between gender feminism and the protagonist of homosexuality. Thus, it is surprising to see, writes Nagasinski, in the work of feminist philosopher like de Beauvoir, the reappearance of the metaphysics of Plato's banquet, which reserved for women, for women only the reproduction of bodies and greatly elevated the love of boys under the pretext that this love concerned the fecundation of souls and not bodies. The love of women is good for those who wish to survive for their children, while the sublimated love of boys is good for those who want to complete, uh, contemplate eternal ideas. How is it possible Angasinski uh, reflects that giving birth children is considered merely an by homosexual intercourse is spiritual one. Although uh, in general, anthropology alternative to Christianity today is materialistic, uh, but in the contemporary discussion, uh, we find uh, we will find a, a lot of idealistic trends. People dissatisfied with their body often say that it doesn't match who they are feeling because they receive it by mistake. So here we have the idea that human identity existed prior to biology. The pre-existing, therefore, the sexless psycho-spiritual element becomes one day associated associated with a specific portion of the matter already shaped in forms of term, in terms of form. And here a man reports a mistake. After all, he feels, and it should be said biologically, a woman. Where from does a man who announces that he feels a woman know how a woman feels during the, her menstrual period? It is not clear. Of course, he may have some idea about it, but ultimately, it is always only a male concept based on outside observation. Thus, now we are dealing here analogically to what uh, we find in Benedict Anderson's writings with the imagined identity. Uh, I am not trying to explain the biological aspect of this phenomenon here, but only the philosophical one. Uh, Excluding the question of fertility, the ability to bring a third person to life, it would be difficult to understand what the sex difference consists in. Being a man or a woman does not come down in acting in the theater, to dressing up to pretend to be the book's hero on stage. A woman may play the boy in the theater of social life, and a man may play the role of a girl. But there are natural limitations in these respects. You can play the role of a boy in bed, writes Agassinsky, but that doesn't mean that you can play the role of a man giving a woman a child. And uh, ultimately, only when we are thinking uh, about the, the conception of a child, then the, the whole meaning of this uh, uh, very complicated uh, biological instrumentation on the side of woman and uh, and man uh, can be understood. Uh, the, in Article Three of the Charter of Family Rights, uh, there is a reference directly to the right of life since conception to the natural death. The spouses have inalienable right to found a family and to decide on the spacing of births and the number of children to be born, taking into full consideration their duties towards themselves, their children already born, their family and society, 
In a just hierarchy of values and in accordance with the objective moral order, which excludes recourse to contraception, sterilization, and abortion. In Article 4, we read, human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. Abortion is a direct violation of the fundamental right to life of the human being. Although marriage is the natural institution to which the mission of transmitting life is exclusively entrusted, marriage is not only about procreation. The family is the privileged place of human socialization. Here, the transfer of values takes place, learning to love and to the spirit of solidarity. Here, different generations meet. Here, the weak, including handicapped children, usually get support. Here, everyone, as we would like to say, is accepted with love. Parents, as the charter reminds, are the first and main educators, and this role should not be taken over by the states as it was under communist. Especially, this parents' right should be granted in the area of moral and religious formation. So children should not have to attend schools where the programs do not agree with the parents' beliefs. Therefore, they should not be forced to attend classes on gender ideology. Family life has also an iconic dimension. In the charter, we read, Families have a right to a social and economic order in which the organization of work permits the memberships, the members to live together and does not hinder the unity, well-being, health, and the stability of the family, while offering also the possibility of wholesome recreation. Here the church is referring to family wage. Remuneration of work must be sufficient for establishing and maintaining a family with dignity, either through a stable salary called a family wage or through other social measures such as family allowances or the remuneration of the work in the home of one of the parents. It should be such that mothers will not be obliged to work outside the home to the detriment of family life and especially of the education of the children. Family wage today doesn't mean only salaries. The charter is rather thinking about family income, which comes from different sources and should be sufficient to grant a proper standard of living to the family. In this context also is important the reference to the women's work at home and to its economic evaluation. The work of the mother in the home must be recognized and respected because of its value for the family and for society, we read in the charter. It's up to politicians to decide how this work should be remunerated. But today, in many countries, governments are granting compensation of different kinds, for example, coverage of social security costs, various types of family allowances, the right to pension, Summarizing, what in the Charter of the Family Rights is challenged in today's politics is exactly the same what uh, in the doctrinal note uh, written by the Congregation of Faith regarding the participation of Catholics in political life is called non-negotiable ethical principles. It is the right of life, the definition of marriage and family, the first and main role of parents in the education of their children, religious freedom, the development of economy that is at the service of human person, and the struggle for just peace. According to the Catholic doctrine, there is no Catholic political party today. But Catholics have the right to be member of different political groups, representing their interests. But whose political program does not prejudge this Christian point of view. But at the same time, there are situations in which those who are directly involved in lawmaking bodies have a grave and clear obligation to oppose 
to different uh, initiatives. If at stake are those non-negotiable values, they are not only encouraged by the church, but they are obliged to vote in defense of them. And they should do this without any uh, inferiority complex. We can say there is no Catholic party, but there is a Catholic vote. We can justly say there should be a kind of Catholic virtual party in the parliament, which becomes visible at the time of ethical crisis. We read in the note, democracy must be based on the true and solid foundation of non-negotiable ethical principles, which are the ardent meaning of life in society. We are aware that the good of the person, of society, of the whole church, passes by way of the family. We are aware that without correct anthropology, there will be no stable families. And without stable families, we'll, we will not overcome the demographic crisis. And without a way out of demographic crisis, you will not be able to secure the future of your nation. A nation which in a Catholic approach is mainly a community of culture. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mazurkevich, for your uh, really uh, deep and insightful and profound presentation. Uh, concerning anthropological um, assumptions uh, which uh, affect uh, family policy, political order. And uh, for me, your presentation also gave a hope that we can find a way to create a reasonable and uh, order, legal order, and or also society friendly to family. I hope that uh, listeners of conference uh, will be able to present you some questions which uh, we will have uh, time and possibility to uh, discuss uh, at the end of the session and um, also i would like to apologize for some technical issues and inconveniences uh, at the beginning of this conference uh, i i will had to take uh, place of moderator of, instead of Audrey's, and I hope that uh, everything will be more or less okay. Uh, several uh, uh, announcements to uh, Lutoinen speakers uh, who listening conference. Now, a few words in Lithuanian. First of all, thank, uh, excuse us for the uh, technical uh, disturbances because the internet, irrespectively of all the internet progress, technological progress is still not perfect. And that's why uh, due to uh, the disturbances, I have taken over the moderation of the conference. Uh, you have the possibility to listen to this conference, both in English and Lithuanian, and you are able to uh, find the Lithuanian and English channel on the YouTube account of uh, our organization, Liz, by the Suomini, the Free Society Institute. And uh, please uh, feel free to choose the language that you require. And, uh, I have a big pleasure and a big honor to present next our speaker, Professor Bogdan Schlachter who is notable and distinguished scholar and is a historian of law and philosopher of politics. He's a professor and head of the Department of Political Philosophy at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Uh, professor Schlachter specializes in the history of political and legal sciences and doctrines. He's a member of the Tribunal of State of Republic of Poland since uh, 2015. Uh, Professor Schlachte is also an author and editor of numerous books and scientific articles. And today, here in Lithuania, we have a great opportunity to uh, listen to a presentation by Professor. 
uh, which uh, uh, title is Catholic Church in Liberal Democracy, Human Person Rights and Human Rights. So uh, uh, Professor Bogdan, floor is yours. Professor, you have to unmute your voice. We can't hear you. Yeah, now. Yes. Thank you very much for invitation to this uh, very interesting uh, conference in Lithuania. My presentation will be uh, more uh, general than uh, even than uh, Professor uh, Piotr Mazurkiewicz from Warsaw, my friend. Uh, so. Uh, my presentation is, is, is general and um, will be delivered in English uh, about uh, very general problems of uh, legal order from uh, about also about relations uh, between law and uh, rights. So the position of the, the Roman Catholic Church as a community of believers with uh, priests as uh, Father Piotr Mazurkiewicz serving in the in the, its uh, hierarchical structure as guides to salvation was shaped in late ancient and medieval monarchies and republics. The process was marked not only but by dualistic and monistic doctrines characteristic uh, of the Latin and Greek world respectively, but also by the formula of Pope Gregory the Great who held his office at the time of the 6th and 7th century. Based on St. Augustine's uh, philosophy, the formula assumed that rulers and their subjects would slowly but surely um, transform their conscience and eventually come onto uh, the path leading to salvation. In uh, what Augustine called the earthly cities, people's intentions would be increasingly motivated not by the fear of punishment, but the promise of redemption, thus moving the, them toward the right and uh, established by God's sacrifice for the sake of mankind, mankind uh, marked by the original sin. Gregory's formula has not been forgotten today. The church still hopes as presented uh, Father, uh, Father uh, Mazurkiewicz for people of different cultures to understand the message of the sacrifice so beautifully expounded already by St. Paul. Less and less, however, is being set on the natural law supposed to set the universal normative boundaries for human actions, perhaps established by God himself and corresponding to the ideal of humanity conceived but by him before the uh, act or process of creation. The idea of fixed norms to be recognized by human reason present even in John Paul II's encyclical Veritatis Splendor or in the International Theological Commission's document in search of a universal ethic, a new look at the natural law is uh, now being abandoned in favor of the rights founded on the innate dignity of every human person created by God. It is uh, uh, precisely uh, this change already mentioned by Pope Benedict XVI uh, in his famous 2000, 2011 Bundestag speech on the increasingly countercultural uh, nature of the Christian science of law. I will argue that this change is determined by the context of liberal democracy and might be seen as a reaction of um, uh, the Catholic Church concerned about the condition of Western societies, where liberal justifications are being used for transgressing the boundaries once set by the norms of natural law. I am not going to analyze here the institutional shape of liberal democracy which does, uh, which does uh, not need uh, an in-depth commentary. The mechanism founded by uh, basic principles, uh, the legislative representation of collect collective uh, sovereign and the separation of powers among a few branches, 
based on the idea of checks and balances, refers to groups of differ, diverse uh, needs and uh, preferences made up uh, the, by individuals who are subjects of human and civil rights granted to them by the Constitution. Instead, what I'm interested in here is the a problem I shall call normative, the confrontation of liberal democratic and Catholic understandings of human and civil rights. I disagree with uh, both with uh, Carl Schmitt, who argued that uh, modernity is uh, founded on the optimistic vision of man, and with Martin Heidegger's thesis that modernity is solipsistic by nature. I rather follow the Jesuit Nafta from Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain in arguing that its main problem is the foundation of modern subjects solely in relations to society. Consequently, the modern man is uh, grounded only in this world and is losing interest in the supernatural end. The ideal of early self-realization was offered your to this man by liberal democracy, which guarantees individuals a set of inviolable uh, rights and uh, liberties. The use of these rights was supposed to make them discover and reveal uh, their needs and preferences no, no longer uh, related to the anticipation of salvation, but rather to the comfortable coexistence with others. My normative problem is not referent, uh, referred uh, to the democratic movement of liberal democracies. I am not concerned with the disputes on the aggregative, deliberative or agonistic nature of democracy as they uh, all share the individualistic perspective on the, of the common. The problem I am concerned with seems to be deeper. No matter how the democratic uh, environment is, is conceptualized, we are already used to thinking of rights and liberties of the individual as the only legitimate point of departure since it, uh, it is uh, the individual who is essentially conceived of as the main actor of this environment. Two remarks, however, need to be made here about today's uh, liberal democracies. First, we shall not forget about the increasing tendency to expose the cultural rights of not only individuals, but also groups. These uh, cultural groups are no longer uh, defined solely by religion, although the growing Muslim population in Western countries makes it the issue up to date, but also by, for example, gender identification. If the rights and liberties are attributed to both individuals and groups, the liberal component of democracies is bound to change dramatically. Consequently, the question will come to, uh, up to uh, who is uh, to be protected by the liberal democratic state. Individuals as prior to the groups uh, they belong to, or the groups which will be granted legal autonomy like medieval corporations. Second, the very nature of the liberal component might be problematic. Especially in the agonistic model, liberalism is uh, said to restrict democracy, which is the area of inconclusive struggle to include those who had been excluded and, as such, it cannot respect any permanent, unquestionable points of reference like the catalog of individual rights and liberties. That said, these problems are uh, of no concern to us as the, we are moving uh, in another direction to grab the nature of uh, some more permanent changes initiated already in the early modern age and ongoing to nowadays with consequences more and more visible to us. Let us start by saying that the classical approach inspired mostly by Aristotle and the Stoics and also used by Roman lawyers uh, recognized, recognized the primacy of the of the normative order not established by God by the people. However, the order was not cons uh, consensually agreed on, but rather found in the nature of things or long-term principles. The appeal to the nature was at times with the Aristotle, uh, founded on the argument of, of inborn inclinations common to all representatives of humankind. 
once the inclinations to live, procreate, belong, and learn the uh, essence of things uh, were found, uh, they had to be protected by what was later on called the norms of natural law, not revealed by God, but, uh, but uh, recognized by uh, the inborn human reason. That way, the normative context was also established for legislation. No matter who uh, the lawmakers were, they were supposed to respect the boundaries uh, set by the norms. As long as, as uh, their legislation was consistent with the norms of natural law, these uh, boundaries were not violated and the lawmaker was doing the right thing, protecting the inborn inclinations of humankind. Human na nature was to be realized both by the lawmaker and individuals supposed to follow the norms and thus live in accordance with their own inclinations. All in all, the construction was simple. Legal order was good and individual action, actions were rightful only if and as long as they followed the superior natural law. That also means that legal and moral elements of the construction were identical as they both uh, shared the common foundation of natural human inclinations. Things got complicated with the coming of the Christians whose teachings were based, were based not on Aristotle's th thesis, but on the thesis found in the Old Testament. Consequently, the superior, superior law was not derived from the nature of things and human inclinations, but came from the outside, revealed by the commanding God. In the late, mid late Middle Ages, Christian philosophers tried to reconcile the teaching of the Bible with the classical thought, the project with, uh, which culminated it, uh, in uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, whose theses were later adopted by many Aristotelians. As argued by Thomas, with clear references to Stoicism, the divine law, law was not directly revealed to humans, but rather naturally inscribed in their hearts. Unlike the pre-Christians' conceptions of the natural law, however, the late um, medieval ones had to consider the distinction into legal and moral normative orders introduced by the dualistic doctrines of early Middle uh, Ages. While the legal order was compelling by nature, the function of the moral order was to guide humans towards salvation. After Thomas, the compelling law was being increasingly associated with state legislation and the moral law with religious teaching. As a consequence, we find the early modern Christianity marked by the two alternative understanding of the superior uh, divine law, either the law of uh, juridical importance in Puritanism, Presbyterianism, and some other Calvinist denominations, or moral law in Catholicism. The tensions uh, in the 16th century Europe, greatly inspired by nominalist and voluntarist ideas, involved the uh, essential reformulation of the function of law, usually ascribed to Hugo Grotius. According to this new formula, so uh, perceptively diagnosed by the Jesuit NAFTA, the universal human reason continued to be the source of fixed natural norms, but the horizon uh, of the application was no longer supernatural. Instead of uh, salvation, the law should rather be concerned with the conditions of social peace. Further on, the French politicians went on to conceptualize the legislative center uh, solely focused on the, the peaceful uh, interpersonal coexistence, just like in Augustine's earthly cities. Finally, Jean Baudin emphasized the <clears throat> role, role of the commanding monarch whose power was to determine the conditions of peace and enforce their observance. However, although commonly labeled as the founder of uh, absolutism, Baudin, following the politicians, did not justify the uh, unconditional primacy of lawmaker. Instead, the choice of religion and family property were those elements 
which had to be respected by all lawmakers, thus setting boundaries to the legislation. To impose the monarch's own religion uh, on uh, others and put arbitrary restriction on their properties was no longer allowed. That way, let us remark, the limits of legislation were uh, again um, defined, defined with reference to early, uh, earthly communities only. At the same time, the freedom of religion allowed for alternative visions of salvation. While some Christians favored the pathway marked by the uh, law of revelation, others respected the limits set by the natural law. Even more importantly, there was no agreement on the relation of natural individual rights to the divine law. Some derived them from the law-making act of God, others preferred to deduce them from the universal human nature. Except for early modern republicanism, the split within the Western Christianity brought about not only the dispute of Protestants with the Catholic schools of, uh, school of Salamanca, but also the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, equally critical of Catholics, Puritans, common law, and the divine right of King's theory. Hobbes rejected the context of religion and property and advocated the theory of the state of nature with individuals led by uh, self-preservation -preser instinct and holding inborn rights, not to the pursuit of uh, salvation, but to all self-preserving actions. Hobbes' uh, project was revolutionary in postulating the existence of natural egoistic um, rights whose uh, only aim was to preserve a living body with no normative uh, boundaries preventing the individual from uh, hurting others. No superior law was to be respected either by the individual or legislator or state, whose uh, function was to establish fundamental norms of the law of nature, thereby restricting rights of uh, individuals in exchange from, uh, for protecting their bodies and peaceful coexistence. What is interesting here, however, is not so much the limitation of rights by the state, but the absence of moral duties. By negating the positive political theology and God's interference in the world of politics, Hobbes both disregarded any supreme law in formulating norms of law of nature and made all moral issues secondary to legal resolutions. Consequently, no morality, either divine or natural, could any longer uh, justify the disobedience uh, to the legislator called state. Even individuals were only allowed to execute their uh, inborn rights if they did not violate the norms established to keep peaceful coexistence. In other words, individuals might not seek peace but uh, had to respect its uh, conditions. When Hobbes denied uh, autonomy of the church and identified state sovereignty with supreme moral jurisdiction, he was not far away from Erastianism with its recognition of state as the only source of church -like legislative, judicial, and sacramental uh, rights. Hobbes made the political order self-centered, focused solely on making and keeping peace between uh, individuals on public safety, safety and uh, order. The problem he faced was uh, how to personally uh, represent the impersonal state when its assumed unity proved illusive uh, and uh, many actors are also religious, claimed the right to representation, vicious uh, power struggles uh, began. The thing is they, uh, that neither their participants nor Hobbes followers respected any supreme law. Admittedly, to restrict legislative freedom, John Locke went uh, on to present a catalog of inviolable inborn rights to be protected by the norms of the law of the, uh, nature, not derived, derived from state, but from human reason. But this project emphasized agreement as the only conception of civil society with its principles and as such uh, it uh, disregarded the role of universal religious morality. 
Equally critical of atheists and papists, Locke basically echoed uh, Hobbes in his concern with the conditions of peace between individuals and nothing more. Unlike classical projects, or even the project of Salamanca of the Salamanca school, his norm of the uh, law of nature was to protect inborn rights, not inclinations. It was these rights further on uh, transformed into uh, human rights, which were supposed to allow individuals for unrestrained uh, articulation of their, of their needs and preferences. They defined the juridical uh, boundaries of subjects' freedom, which uh, could be violated uh, by no lawmaker, the institutions of civil uh, society included. As we have already observed, there is a clear tension between the natural law and the law of nature. Advocates of the former put emphasis on the realization of inborn inclinations, view rights as manifestations of this realization and natural law as a set of norms protecting the inclinations and indicating the limits of rightful actions. Advocates of the uh, latter emphasize inborn rights of the subject whose execution may uh, not be restrained either by other uh, individuals, state or church. For proponents of the natural law, state legislation is supposed to protect inclinations and respect the supreme law they have been secured by in uh, the first place. Of the law of nature, state legislation is only supposed to interpret the unviolable status of the rights. The supreme law can still be found there, but only as a guarantor uh, of the rights to live, stay healthy, move places, and dispose of proper properties, not as a pathway to salvation. Individuals are then protected against the normative claims of both the, both the state, church, and groups they belong to. At any time, the individuals can, they can separate from these uh, entities for the sake of their rights. Last but not least, while for the advocates of the natural law, family is a natural group or even a sacramental union established to raise offspring. For advocates of the law of nature, it is merely civil union based on mutual agreement. As long as there were widespread mass parties supposed to reflect the interest of nations of so social classes, so let us say, until the 1950s, there was a tendency to picture individuals uh, as parts of some bigger whole, class, nation, or even church and identify their, uh, their particular natures with uh, group uh, particularities. Uh, uh, actually, it is only the slogans that, uh, of the end of history and global individualistic project of the 1990s that finally dissolved national and religious particularities. From that time on, individuality has clearly been uh, prioritized uh, and simplified uh, liberal arguments have been used to picture all groups, apart from cultural groups, as critical point of reference and foundations for so-called populisms. The struggle of this simplified liberalism with populist projects can easily be called the sign of our times. Among the populism, there is also the Catholic-based project with the natural law as a critical counterpoint to the liberal understandings of inborn human rights. Attempts of the church to stay independent of uh, political powers and uh, exert influence on the political sphere only by means of citizens were contested, uh, contested in the 17th and 18th century first by regalism, and then by, then by uh, democratic, uh, democratic tendencies uh, where uh, king uh, got replaced by the people or political nation. Thanks to the doctrine of sovereignty, it is the people who uh, then held exclusive rights to legislative and determine the limits of individual, individual liberties, thus deciding on the con uh, content of law with no intermediate bodies like communities or, of believers. 
Erastian tendencies got involved in the theory of democracy, democracy with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who made the express, uh, expression of general will by the sovereign people into the of legal order and thereby sublated the Christian conflicts over, over uh, loyalty either to God or to the emperor by the general will of free and equal uh, individuals. Free to legislate and equal in the legislative voice. Rousseau's uh, democratic doctrine justified, at least theoretically, both the dominance of state over church and other communities subject to the, to the general will and uh, the dominance of this will over priva private uh, wills of believers. All intermediate bodies uh, treated at the identification of particular wills with the general will end as such they could be abolished as an uh, obstacle on the way to freedom of the person, of the individual. This freedom was uh, also potentially treated by fem family, which was contested by the followers uh, of Rousseau as the institution mainly focused on particular interests of its members. Both parents and children were believed to realize their freedom only if and as long as they belonged to the people and served it, which made it justified uh, for the people to legally impose methods for, of raising and educating a child. And if we add to this that family was only supposed to care for the productivity of bodies, uh, not for uh, future for salvation, the path to biopolitics focused on the discipl uh, discipline uh, of bodies was made wide open. It is not this tendency, however, which has recently been given um, the primacy, but the individualistic one. Unlike early modern individualism, it is uh, not so much focused on the defin defining uh, the limits of state activity and establishing the untouchable a private sphere, but on guaranteeing individuals the execution, execution of the rights freed from the outdated restrictions of legal and moral nature. As a result, churches have been made into the associations of individuals professing the same religion and the, the so-called liberal separatism is increasingly calling for state neutrality with moral norms treating it as particular normative proposition, not been binding, binding uh, for all the citizens. Admittedly, um, it is already philosophers of the Enlightenment who deprived the state of its religious functions and confined them uh, solely to uh, peacekeeping, but the peace could then be preserved by the Voltarian uh, uh, enlightened uh, monarch. Now the main actors are individuals whose choices determine the foundation of the binding uh, norms, usually based on the arithmetic majority principle. This tendency has also been understood by the church, which beginning uh, with the second uh, Vatican Council has abandoned the traditional primacy of truth over freedom in favor of the rights of the of a human person and not of the human rights as moral empty. It is state institutions which have been made responsible for keeping this new deal. Churches are uh, allowed to teach and thanks to the freedom of religion uh, individuals are allowed to follow the teachings in their lives um, but as the state is supposed to be neutral no church uh, teachings, no matter if based on revelation or reason, can only longer be given a legal value. Although the Catholic Church keeps in, uh, insisting on uh, its uh, exceptional uh, teaching authority, which uh, should guide both citizens in, and rulers, it has now been uh, recognized as merely one of multiple intermediate uh, structures, which shall be confined to the private non-political sphere. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Jonathan Schlachter, for really impressive and insightful uh, presentation. 
and for giving us a better understanding of the evolution of political ideas which affect our today life. Uh, for me, it was particularly in interesting uh, distinction between uh, natural law and the law of nature. And uh, uh, thank you for your uh, allowing to better understand how natural law is important for uh, preserving our human rights and uh, freedoms, and also why uh, liberal democracy project still struggling with uh, 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 protection of those rights. So uh, it was really worth listening. And uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to hear uh, some more answers to questions uh, uh, at the end of this uh, session. And uh, right now I switch to Lithuanian language. Now, I would like, uh, uh, with great pleasure, to introduce to you another speaker, and uh, probably the Lithuanian audience uh, has already met uh, this speaker many times, uh, Mr. Uh, Alvidas Jokubait is professor at Vilnius University, a political philosopher, author of the monographs like Liberalism as a Civil relig uh, Religion, Tyranny of Values and Politics and others. And uh, uh, he's one of the philosophers whose books could be read by uh, the uh, audience at large, not only by uh, the narrow circles of philosophers. And he allows uh, everyone to uh, get a grasp of what is happening around the world. And we now have the possibility to listen to Mr. Alvida's uh, presentation uh, on whether the EU needs uh, the family or not. Pierre uh, Manan called one of his uh, last uh, politics chapters uh, the marriage for everyone and uh, it can be called uh, differently uh, the family for everyone marriage for everyone and uh, Mon Mon uh, thinks that uh, he we have to actually uh, separate uh, different things uh, the require requirements for uh, the hom homosexual uh, for the rights of the homosexual uh, qualities uh, se separately from uh, the construct of marriage and uh, the uh, natural uh, the human nature actually does not give any indications as to the actions uh, the Lithuanians have, uh, their understanding towards uh, agenda issues. They become metaphysicists. Why? Uh, the marriage institute has so far had d the differentiation be between genders, which is no longer acceptable because um, politically we are equal and that's why we want to uh, make an equation mark between everything uh, because the marriage institute itself becomes uh, discriminatory so far marriage has been based on the natural differences between man and woman and it was settled now it is believed that uh, uh, the pos positive law should not consider such differences. Why is it a me metaphysical uh, um, uh, statement? Because uh, it is suggested that, that we should undermine the natural laws and uh, undermine the nature and uh, move towards the metaphysicism. Lithuanians uh, today have only the soul, but not the body. That is, they have almost become angels. Manen uh, asks why there are so many citizens uh, of liberal Western societies who have become metaphysicists, that is, they adhere to philosophical convictions. We have a very simple reply, well, wide known. Uh, 
human laws may undermine the natural laws and they don't it does it uh, is related not only to the homosexual marriages uh, they also uh, close their eyes uh, on various other differences like generational differences the differences between humans and animals love and pornography and uh, um, humiliating violence and uh, entertainment and and uh, so on. Uh, previously, philosophy used uh, uh, used to know uh, the human nature, but now uh, the, it has to fight social stereotypes and has to prove that everything is only the social constructs which are uh, meant to uh, destroy. And uh, the uh, Christians used to be rebuked for about speaking uh, on the issues which are empirical which are not seen like God, uh, uh, conscience, uh, sin, angels and demons, uh, the uh, Holy Spirit and heaven and hell. And now uh, this list has been actually supplemented by marriage. Uh, it has become an abstract uh, concept which can contain anything. Uh, the Constitutional Court of Lithuania made a judgment on the 28th of September 2011. Um, and I will quote, the marriage construct cannot stem only from the Institute of Marriage and uh, a quote again uh, it is uh, there are different families uh, based on other things than marriage and uh, uh, what do we mean by family in Lithuania as of 2011 uh, quote the common life between man and woman based on permanent emotional uh, attachment, uh, mutual understanding, responsibility and respect, uh, joint uh, children upbringing and similar relationships, as well as voluntary uh, resolution to undertake certain rights and obligations, unquote. It is not uh, uh, difficult to notice that uh, this definition by the Constitutional Court of the family has uh, justified polygamy and uh, Mormons and fundamentalists uh, may rejoice in Lithuania. However, this is not the end of story. In 2019, that is two years ago, on the 11th of January, uh, the Constitutional Court of Lithuania expanded uh, the concept of marriage. And uh, it says, quote, uh, the constitutional concept of marriage, apart from um, uh, everything, is neutral in terms of gender. Uh, thank you, uh, Thomas Dabkus, for showing, uh, pointing out uh, to this uh, constitutional court uh, resolution, which was not easy to find. I'm not a specialist of constitutional law, but uh, with this uh, um, decision, with this ruling, the constitutional court deconstructed uh, the marriage institution. And uh, uh, elsewhere, it says, I, I'm quoting, marriage consists, marriage is concluded uh, by a voluntary um, uh, agreement by man and woman. So actually, this is the Constitution, while uh, in 2019, it was ruled that the constitutional concept of the family is neutral in terms of gender. Uh, that means in 2011, the family was separated from marriage in Lithuania, while in 2019, it was separated from gender. And it was done by nine judges of the Constitutional Court. And... Uh, in order to change, uh, to amend the constitution, uh, there is uh, a requirement to have at least 300,000 signatures of the Lithuanian nationals or one fourth of members of parliament. And that's not at all in the same as it should be voted twice with a break between the votings of three months and by at least two thirds of the parliament members. Uh, there's another way, a referendum, but 
nothing uh, was applied and the constitutional court which is the guardian of the constitution uh, made an action very easily which is uh, to my mind is an amendment makes an amendment to the constitution even if we agree with uh, the statement of uh, uh, pierre manent that uh, the um, argument on the marriage has become metaphysical and that's why uh, discussions may go um, continue on end uh, the concept of marriage has become the object of metaphysical speculations and uh, uh, the judges have changed the, the citizens uh, have replaced the citizens and two thirds of uh, members of parliament on the streets of the neighborly Poland after such an invasion of metaphysics into the life of the society it would uh, uh, it would be guaranteed that many demonstrations would have started on the streets and those who protect the traditional family in Lithuania at the moment have to fight, first of all, not for the marriage, but for democracy, because uh, the legal fight for the family has been lost. Uh, we lost against the constitutional court because uh, the rulings of the constitutional court are final and without the right of appeal. Pierre Manin did not note one important uh, issue. The metaphysicists of uh, uh, the marriage concept uh, do not believe that it is not it is possible to find uh, the physical um, moral foundation they believe that this is relative but they do not apply uh, the relativism to themselves everything is relative in lithuania today except for the attitude of the constitutional court which is now absolute let, uh, let us leave the legal side aside. aside. Uh, metaphysicism is at the moment discrimination because there are more equals among the equals. And uh, if we acknowledge that uh, there's uh, no family based on the marriage or, uh, or the union between man and woman, it is no longer existent because the family is gender neutral the result becomes something unexpected. Uh, we no longer have the understanding of the family. And um, it is just as lawful to protect the family as to uh, deny it. The principle in favor of the family becomes uh, just as good or bad as uh, a principle uh, of being no family whatsoever. However, what is the argument and the basis of the Constitutional Court? If they believe that they have protected the right of uh, sexual minorities to the family, uh, they uh, are erroneous because a gender neutral family is not a family. I will quote, uh, this is an emotional attachment and mutual understanding and respect. Therefore, congratulations. According to the understanding of our Lithuanian family, we are uh, all family. I have come here not uh, uh, to a conference, but to a family. Logically thinking, this is the situation we are in now. Why uh, does the discussion on the family uh, ends with the uh, disappearance of the family purpose? Uh, I thought that it was not possible. From the very start of its appearance, political liberalism had to be neutral in terms of uh, morale, and it was. This meant that uh, sooner or later it had to be neutral towards uh, the family in other words there's no uh, the, the there's no right or wrong in terms of the family these are only opinions the liberals do not have uh, their moral philosophy and uh, this is 
uh, that uh, this um, is a matter of discussions because uh, the liberal politicians actually allow everyone to have their own philosophy uh, when there are discussions about the family the liberal uh, the liberals say yes and no at the same time and uh, they may they allow to say two contradictory statements about the family at uh, one time yes and no and this actually can be read at the highest level, that is at the constitutional uh, court. Uh, the uh, family that has a gender and the family which is gender neutral is yes and no. If we may say that we are in favor of the traditional family, but we also be against the traditional family at the same time. Can you imagine politically, I may say that I am neutral in terms of family and um, in terms of morale, I may say that I am in favor of a traditional family or a different family. I don't remember the that there has been any analogous phenomena in our um, philosophy of morale when we can define that yes is no at the same and that no uh, is yes at the same time and actually this is being done in order to protect the freedom this is the official statement no one should think that uh, the traditional family is something worse than a gender neutral family. Uh, however, it, they want to prove that nobody has proven that there is a better uh, form of family. It depends upon the choice of individual. If uh, an individual chooses a marriage with a computer, that would actually make a family according to our current legal definition of the family at the moment we are in favor of any form of the family and we can do without a family paul uh, fairraben principle uh, everything goes uh, is valid although this is absolutely out of place not in the place uh, which was meant by paul fairraben and in uh, the Matthew's book, uh, Jesus says, say yes, if yes, no, if no, but this is no longer valid in Lithuania, where yes and no is being said at the same time. We are in favor of this family or that family or not that family, but nobody has proven that uh, both statements, yes and no, being said at the same time uh, does not destroy the object itself. Uh, actually, we, are, we no longer have what you speak about because the family is no longer existent when we say yes and no. Uh, lawyers like speaking, and uh, this is a very interesting part for us. I remember those uh, the times uh, lawyers uh, like speaking about the intentions of the, uh, the of the creators of the primary uh, constitution and uh, these intentions are easy to trace back in terms of the lithuanian constitution because it happened just recently many people remember when the lithuanian constitution was adopted what uh, uh, family uh, concept we had uh, in the minds of Lithuanian people. In uh, the times of Sayudis, uh, the understanding of a family was not doubted and no one was saying yes and no at the same time. The current uh, understanding has been imported from the European Human Rights Court and the uh, European Union or uh, to make it short, made in EU. The uh, creators of the Lithuanian constitution and uh, the nation that stood behind them spoke very clearly and loud when the constitution was being adopted. Of course, the American constitution uh, was uh, uh, adopted uh, several hundred years ago, but here in Lithuania we remember very well what the situation was like and what people thought about the family. But at the moment when yes and no is being said at the same time is uh, actually 
uh, dangerous not in uh, only in the fight uh, which we have lost at the political and legal level but it is also dangerous because uh, the nation comes next because uh, uh, the saying of yes and no at the same time will eliminate the nation as well and uh, democracy as well and when this metaphysicism becomes valid when at the political level uh, you state that everyone can choose yes and no and in at the political level and uh, individually everybody can choose whatever they want i should say that this will uh, serve um, wrong for the eu do we need the european union yes and no because the individuals can choose and the european union uh, will not be able to bear such a load the family does not and no one can uh, withstand such uh, an, a, a nuclear weapon because this is a nuclear weapon which can destroy everything and the family is only one of these episodes this is the destructive metaphysicism and philosophy and uh, no one can withstand it thank you Thank you, Professor Alvidas, for this provocative and very clear presentation and explanations. The Court of Human, the European Court of Human Rights, when speaking about freedom of expression, likes to say that uh, freedom of expression includes the right to provoke and say things that might shock. Uh, others or be to others disliking. Well, you have touched upon several topics and I believe that your presentation uh, can be a bridge towards um, uh, the last part of this session of the conference, that is um, uh, our discussions, questions and answers. So I will start with you, Professor, because you were the last to speak. So you mentioned several times that the fight for the concept of uh, the family has been lost and we as societies must unite and our last hope is democracy. But all those smart lawyers who were mentioned uh, uh, several times today will tell you that human rights are not something that can be supported by a democratic process that nobody can understand how many rights uh, minorities should have. So um, isn't it that they already have a vaccine against this fight? Well, you said that the constitutional court uh, uh, is able to change our constitution and uh, uh, well, lawyers uh, try to create our immunity against choosing the values that the majority want. Yes, it might be that lawyers have vaccines against democracy. Well, this reminds me of um, the Rzeczpospolita Union. Well, it was a liberal uh, order. They had monarchy and aristocracy. And I think that such a republic could be our last straw. I, I don't imagine otherwise what can save us and what can stop this. Well, um, after I've heard your words, well, we should ask the question, what is the origin of law? Does the origin result in from a specific order or does it result from certain norms which are abstract and are not related to that specific order? So can Lithuanians live according to the legal norms that came to Lithuania from I don't know where? Well, if we don't need democracy anymore, which I doubt, uh, well, 
we can also say yes or no to democracy at the same time, but uh, I said that all this is also harmful to democracy, but as I said, lawyers also have vaccines against democracy. Uh, well, we needed to go by way of referendum in order to establish the 19th century norm. I do understand that it's difficult to organize a referendum, but I have a question. So did the Lithuanian Constitutional Court try to protect the Constitution or has it started um, creating the Constitution? Thank you very much. We have a few more questions. I would like to remind our listeners that uh, you can post your questions in the chat window next to the YouTube broadcast. Well, we won't be able to answer all of them, but uh, we'll try to pass on at least some of your questions to our speakers. Well, I see several uh, questions for Professor Bogdan. I will try and switch to the other uh, language channel. Uh, so, uh, Professor Bogdan, uh, uh, there are a couple of questions for you. Uh, one question is uh, uh, relating uh, the relevance or importance of natural law concept for our time. The question is uh, that uh, liberalism was, among other things, liberation from classical natural law. Is natural law still can be relevant in the age of liberal democracy? Thank you. Thank you for this uh, question. Very interesting question. Uh, from my point of view, uh, first of all, in the Catholic uh, the Church, we have still in the, inside the, the Catholic uh, social teaching uh, the uh, relations to the, the classical uh, natural law. Uh, as I, I, I said, uh, in 2009, uh, was established very interesting document uh, in search of uh, universal ethic, a uh, new look at the natural law by the International Theologi the Theological Commission. And then, uh, and there we have a very interesting presentation, Thomistic, first of all, um, perspective on natural law. Uh, I, uh, as I um, said, uh, I think that uh, uh, in, in uh, modern time, we have problem with um, natural law because natural law is the uh, perspective on a normative uh, context for the, the human uh, action. Uh, but uh, in the modern uh, time, first of all, not normative context, but by uh, but uh, the, the uh, rights which are not. Uh, um, which are not show from the perspective of, of this uh, uh, natural law uh, normative context um, present. Problem is in this that uh, in the modern time we have, uh, first of all, school of natural law, uh, rights and not natural law. Problem, uh, the, the crucial problem here is uh, in this that uh, from the classical natural law, we have some uh, set of of, uh, of uh, norms which are which uh, uh, present the ne negative um, uh, boundaries for uh, human action, and from uh, from our uh, modern uh, perspective, we have first of all individual which is uh, free from uh, all uh, boundaries. Which are which are uh, based on the on the uh, uh, natural inclinations, for example, which are uh, defended by the norms uh, of the, the natural law. So now, in twenty uh, first in the twenty first uh, century, uh, we have problem with this that we have uh, first of all the thinking on the natural rights and not natural law. Yeah, 
from uh, individualistic uh, perspective, we have uh, the so-called uh, natural uh, rights with, as uh, 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 human rights, which, uh, uh, which uh, cre created us as uh, individuals, as uh, solely actors to, uh, to, uh, uh, to stand with, at the, our will, uh, arbitrarily, uh, uh, our 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 uh, acts or our uh, preferences and so on. So now this problem with uh, the, the the Catholic uh, perspective on natural law, we must still uh, relate to relate to the to the, the this uh, very modern and liberal uh, presentation of the, the natural rights. Uh, instead of the uh, natural law. As I said, uh, this uh, very modern um, perspective on the, the natural or human rights is connected with this new or modern of, of um, early modern uh, liberal uh, concept of law of, the, of uh, nature which is presented, was presented uh, in the, um, first of all, theories of, the, of, of uh, such uh, English, first of all, in, and, uh, and uh, not only English, but also from Netherlands, uh, authors as uh, Hugo Grotius, uh, Thomas Hobbes, or uh, John Locke. We, as a Catholic, I am a Catholic, we have the problem with this, as I think, that we must um, we must uh, relate uh, relate this uh, this uh, two uh, uh, various uh, projects. First, normative project, project which is uh, connected with uh, the uh, classical uh, natural law uh, theories, with this very modern or liberal uh, conceptions of of uh, individual might and not uh, not uh, norms uh, individual rights which which uh, 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 are the, the juridical uh, juridical uh, 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 connection with with uh, the, this uh, factual uh, might of the of the uh, each uh, individual as I, 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 I uh, present, uh, I think that this uh, problem is uh, for uh, our uh, contemporary uh, discussions, the, the mind, mind context, mind context because uh, a Catholic uh, presentation of the natural law is uh, for uh, many, many people, uh, majority uh, people, and first of all in this, uh, uh, the mine, mine uh, position of the, the liberal in the liberal uh, democracies uh, crucial. Uh, we, we must think about this uh, um, relations between our uh, project, natural law project, normative project, and this uh, problem of the, the of the mighty, which is also right uh, in the. Uh, which, which are rooted in, uh, in uh, uh, modern uh, liberal uh, positions. Here is, for me, crucial problem. The next problems uh, uh, with family uh, and, and with uh, marriage and with uh, this uh, uh, very um, uh, various uh, presentation of, of uh, sexual uh, orientations are the Second, uh, the second, uh, second uh, problems, which are uh, which are consequences of this of this first uh, crucial problem, which are uh, which uh, which uh, I uh, proved to uh, present you today. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, exhaustive answer, and uh, we also have a question to Professor Piotr. Um, as I know, uh, Father Piotr, uh, who is also a priest, uh, he worked uh, several years in Brussels uh, in uh, European um, uh, in, uh, uh, Council of uh, 
European Bishops Conference. He was uh, general secretary of this organization, and this organization was established by a Catholic Church in order to foster relations and a dialogue with the European Union. And uh, in European Union, among uh, the most uh, valued and respected values is equality. And the question is related uh, to this value. You spoke about the principles and um, possibilities of reasonable and uh, family-friendly policy. And what about equality in uh, uh, the family policy? Can uh, this principle or this value, or European value of equality uh, find some place in the uh, reasoning about um, family policy? And there also was a question related to this. What are your views on public policy ideas to encourage fathers to go on paternal leave more frequently or uh, to go on paternal leave uh, on equal terms with uh, mothers? Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, uh, first thing is uh, that when when we are talking on uh, equality, um, uh, already there there is a uh, presupposition concerning uh, uh, anthropology, so the the view of a man and a woman, and uh, uh, in, a, in a Christian approach, we we know that man and woman are equal in dignity, but at the same time, they are different. Uh, so in uh, some areas, this uh, uh, difference is playing an important role. In other areas, uh, does not play an important role. And, uh, and uh, in such a case, uh, uh, to treat differently uh, man and woman uh, is a kind of uh, discrimination. So, uh, mm, um, but in the EU, I think uh, uh, there are very few people talking today on equality. Uh, this uh, language was totally uh, uh, replaced by the uh, talk on non-discrimination uh, policy. And uh, in uh, uh, in old documents, uh, this uh, non-discrimination uh, is really concerning the uh, relationship, uh, especially concerning uh, equal wage uh, for equal work uh, between man for man and a woman. Uh, and this you can find in, in those old directives. Uh, in uh, new directives and new proposals, uh, this uh, non-discrimination is uh, related mostly to LGBT ideology. Uh, so if uh, uh, also the relationship between man and woman is covered by this, uh, this kind of uh, directive or regulation, um, uh, it's not the, the main aim. The main aim is to grant equal rights to all those uh, 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 mostly sexual minorities. That's, that's one thing. Then when, uh, when we are going to the, this very concrete uh, issue concerning paternal leave, uh, the question is, uh, uh, yes, but paternal leave for what? So if the father should go for a leave, so what is the purpose of, of this? And uh, it's clear that uh, it is uh, very important for also for fathers to spend uh, time with the family, with uh, little children, uh, because this is creating the bonds and, and uh, uh, that's the sense of, of unity and also, uh, also of, of um, a special responsibility for a child and uh, of the acceptance on the child, uh, uh, on the child side, acceptance by the father. So in this sense, it's very important that fathers should spend time with uh, with the family and with with children. And uh, uh, 
I think that, uh, uh, especially due to the pandemic time, uh, it's more or less realized in, in Europe in this sense that a lot of people are just working at home. Uh, so uh, I, I have a, a lot of good uh, uh, experiences, uh, testimonies that, that, uh, this is so, uh, um, that the family is also profiting out of, of, of this uh, um, uh, very specific uh, um, uh, circumstances. But uh, um, uh, on the other hand, uh, so they can be paternal leave uh, just to to grant to the father time to which he should spend with uh, with children. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, you can imagine also the situation that both parents are working, and uh, they are uh, important reasons why women. Uh, should quite soon go back to work. So I don't think that this is a very uh, uh, popular situation, but I know uh, situations like this that that, that uh, really uh, uh, also for the family, the, the work of a woman was more important than just the, the, the work of, of the father. Uh, and so this means that, uh, that you can imagine that uh, uh, the very existence of this uh, institution of paternal leave uh, uh, can create some opportunities also for, for the family. Um, on the other hand, uh, the opportunity here is that still this is called paternal leave. So we have maternal leave and paternal leave and not the uh, parental leave. Because uh, when this, uh, there, there was this discussion of paternal leave in the European Commission, uh, it was clear that some people supported this uh, uh, with this sense of, of um, equality of rights between men and women. On the other hand, this was, there were a, a strong group of people supporting this uh, from a very ideological position. Uh, so just recent days, uh, we, uh, we learned that uh, in England, uh, in the hospitals, uh, disappeared the word mother and father. There are only parents, parent who is giving birth and not mother. And that uh, this parent who is giving birth is uh, breeding the child by the chest, not by the breast. Uh, it means that uh, a man also can breed the, the little baby because has a chest. Uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, we uh, we had uh, this uh, decision of President Biden uh, to uh, establish the the common competition for women and men who feel like women. women. Uh, and that's uh, that's sort of an, another example of uh, an ideology. So I think that uh, here is. Uh, is uh, very important that that uh, uh, if we are referring to the, to the proper anthropology, we see that uh, uh, there is uh, this sense of equality, but also this sense of difference uh, between man and woman, and uh, and uh, the, uh, of different roles they are playing in front of a child that they are playing in the family. And uh, if, uh, if you will uh, uh, try to, uh, in a social sense or legal sense, to cancel this, this difference, uh, this will be against the family and also against uh, uh, children. Uh, so, uh, 
here, uh, when, when we are talking on the partner leave, uh, that question is, is this mandatory in the law or not? Is this replacing the maternal leave or something additional so that the time for the leave for the mother is not diminished and the state is renting some additional months also for or weeks also for, for the father? Or uh, uh, just this, uh, this um, paternal leave is deduced from the maternal leave. In, uh, in both sense, in both situations, the sense of, of such a decision is, in my understanding, uh, totally um, uh, different. Uh, I think that that's more or less all I would like to say. Thank you very much, uh, Father Piotr, for uh, explanation and uh, comprehensive answer. Uh, well, uh, we have got uh, quite many questions, and those questions are really interesting, and um, some of them are quite sophisticated. Unfortunately, our time is limited, uh, but um, still, uh, I would like to use this uh, last minutes of our discussion for asking question to all presenters. Uh, our conference was also about the, the future of Europe. And uh, it would be interesting to hear from you. All of you are political scientists who follow processes, who uh, understand inner logic of uh, the processes which shape our contemporary society and, and contemporary uh, Western civilization. Uh, and the question for each of you, how do you see the nearest future of Europe in, um, uh, in the context of those processes? Um, Maybe uh, Professor Piotr, we could start from you. Uh, if we are looking just on the very near future, so we have a program of the European Commission, uh, which are trying to push uh, same-sex uh, capital recognition on all the member states uh, with different uh, instruments. And uh, uh, I don't think that uh, this policy of this current commission will be changed during this uh, term. Uh, so uh, that's also, uh, we see in Poland that this pressure uh, from uh, Brussels is uh, still growing. Uh, and uh, um, I think that if, if we will take a longer distance, so we see that uh, uh, because this is a utopian vision of Europe and utopian vision of, of societies and, and, uh, and uh, of the family. Uh, so uh, uh, there is also a movement, a kind of, of rebellion in the societies. Uh, usually this is start by the, the mainstream politicians called uh, a, a kind of populism. But uh, you see that, that uh, in different countries, this, uh, uh, this reaction on, to this kind of policy is uh, uh, or just appearing now as, a, as an organized action or, a, or a, 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 is, is, is growing. And uh, this can also provoke in the future the radical change of the direction. Uh, in the uh, EU policy, but also in, in, uh, in national policies in, in, in the member states. In my understanding, the role of Central Europe here is, is very important uh, because uh, when, when you're just looking on, on those uh, uh, changing in, changing in the laws, so, uh, when uh, uh, so-called same-sex uh, marriage was introduced in some Western European countries, in the same uh, time, in Central Europe, uh, uh, too many constitutions were introduced the definition of marriage as a union of one man and one woman. Uh, 
uh, I think that what, what you have uh, now in Lithuania is uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, the constitution can be reinterpreted. So without the change of the constitution, you, ca you can by uh, the interpretation by the constitutional court really change the, uh, radically the, the meaning of the constitution. Uh, we had, uh, uh, I think, very interesting uh, debate in the USA when uh, on the federal level they uh, introduced uh, the um, same-sex couples and so there was a, a, a dissenting uh, uh, vote by uh, uh, Judge Scalia who, who was explaining how it is possible that uh, the majority of nine people can change the constitution of the USA, even if they are not elected in democratic elections. And uh, that this is uh, changing totally the understanding of, of uh, what is democracy and how does it function. But on the other hand, uh, we might expect that uh, due to this kind of organization of uh, this uh, political scene and political decision making, uh, that uh, might be that, uh, for example, the raw case will be uh, reverted. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, when we are talking on the democracy, it's not the question only of the majority in the parliament, but also on the majority of uh, in uh, in the courts or in the constitutional courts, uh, because this this majority is uh, is now so these institutions these courts are playing a kind a role of a, a kind of a third chamber of the parliament, so that uh, uh, even if they are not elected, then not just checking if the law is uh, uh, in accordance with the constitution, but they are reinterpreted the constitution and this way they, introdu they are introducing to the system, legal system, new laws. Uh, so this can be also a chance uh, for the future, but uh, on the other hand, when, when we are looking why this process we have in Europe, this is, this is a part of the secularization process. So that, that uh, even if we are referring to the natural law, we can say that those uh, who are convinced materialists, they don't recognize the natural law and they don't recognize any limits of their own power. So uh, I think that with, uh, uh, with uh, the requestrangization of Europe, we can build a new future for, for the continent. Thank you for giving at least some hope that not everything is lost. And uh, uh, Professor Bogdan, uh, also you have Western science. How do you see the, our future in Europe? Thank you. Uh, I'm, my position is not so uh, optimistic that, that, that Professor uh, Piotr Mazurkiewicz, Father Piotr, uh, this uh, relations between uh, the experiences of the, the United States of America and, and Europe are quite uh, quite uh, another. I think that the uh, American um, situation, even after this uh, uh, last uh, election, is quite another than uh, our in Europe. I think that we have now uh, this problem that that um, my position in the uh, European elites is uh, radical uh, liberal, as relativistic and and um, very very um, radical uh, in this. Uh, um, concepts uh, with these concepts uh, of. Uh, uh, human rights and so on. Human rights as uh, a, a might with from from 
which we could, could create our our uh, preferences, our uh, arts, and so on. Uh, I think that uh, that here is a very important uh, moment in our uh, European history of, of our uh, European cultural history. Uh, if, from my point of view, uh, first of all, all uh, Catholic uh, could not have a very clear position in this uh, uh, fundamental uh, fundamental uh, connection with the natural law, classical natural law uh, language. We have no chance with uh, with uh, this uh, mind uh, process of mind. Uh, groups or uh, elites uh, in the uh, countries which are members of the European Union. Uh, as a lawyer, as uh, I, I could uh, uh, say that um, constitutional courts, also uh, European courts uh, are uh, connected and are uh, still uh, with this uh, very modern um, thinking about uh, human rights as a might and not uh, uh, um, only uh, a set of uh, rights which are uh, uh, connected with, with the, uh, the private sphere. Here is problem, very interesting from, uh, from the point of view of uh, lawyers now, because uh, former liberal um, position in which uh, uh, rights are the um, set of, uh, of uh, the juridical uh, presentation of uh, uh, private sphere is now, uh, uh, is uh, evaluated now, evalu is evaluating now towards uh, the position of rights as a um, as a positive uh, foundation for uh, arbitrary uh, acts of uh, every every person, here is problem in this also that negative uh, presentation of uh, human rights from the seventeenth uh, till the mid twentieth century. After the Second World, uh, World War, uh, uh, collapse in in uh, the perspective in which we have uh, rights as a positive uh, foundation for uh, for uh, for uh, arbitrary uh, action, actions of uh, every person, and this positive and not negative, but a positive um, the presentation of rights are now a very important uh, place, now a very important role in, uh, in um, uh, constitutional courts, in also in American, uh, American uh, courts. So I am not very, very um, optimistic, but I think that, uh, first of all, Catholic uh, could uh, now uh, create a very clear position and uh, as a uh, actor, as, as I think, uh, important actor in uh, discussions, they could uh, present a very interesting proposition, counter proposition to this uh, mine, uh, mine uh, group, uh, which uh, plays crucial role in the EU, EU member states. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, I think that uh, many of us actually are looking forward to at last uh, to have some uh, conceptual vision, which could, could be a plausible alternative to contemporary situation. And uh, from your uh, thoughts and uh, suggestions, uh, it seems that it's still possible for us to have some alternative concepts which could be com competitive in um, the view in the context of uh, contemporary society. So thank you very much. And now I switch again to the uh, Ukrainian. Professor Alvide, Europa Statistics. 
Alvidas. Uh, what about the future of European Union and our future in the European Union? Well, I'll try to be brief. I will combine Augustine and Hegel. And uh, I know that uh, you are now frightened, uh, St. Augustine and Hegel. Uh, St. Augustine says that uh, there are three temporal moduses, uh, the past, the present, and the future. The EU needs the future. Leaders need to lead us to the future. The leader needs ideas. If you have ideas, you have to be capable to impl implement them, risk, and be enthusiastic. And in the current European Union, I see no none of these things even if we want to see them very much there are no leaders there's no future for the benefit of which people would like to sacrifice themselves and do what our ancestors did when they were fighting for the independence of lithuania uh, that is, uh, we need an idea uh, for the benefit of which we do things what is left and this is what i'm concerned with uh, both in the eu and here because we are left with uh, the present only and uh, the present is being managed by the executive power uh, everything has turned into the policy the executive power and bureaucracy because we have been taken away of the future and uh, what uh, will happen to democracy democracy will imitate that is functioning and if you do function if you see the purpose in the future uh, thing people do uh, things but because this non this is non-existent then we will have just the present bureaucracy only uh, techniques and uh, everybody will be imitating that they do something and to make it easier we will uh, start believing that well indeed things are being done and they do happen but the worst what can happen in the context of the pandemics is that uh, we may get used to the police regime because we have granted the possibilities for that and this police regime may become the regime of the present because we will get stuck uh, because there will be nothing that will lead us to the future because uh, the future has been imitated i was born in the soviet union and i know what it looks like when everybody imitates that they are going forward i used to be a um a young uh, uh, communist and uh, uh, I did not believe in communism, but they thought I did. And, uh, and they thought that I will go where they want me to go, but I did not. And uh, this is sad that we are imita imitating the situation. But of course, uh, hope always lasts, uh, dies the last. Thank you, Professor. Uh, you mentioned uh, grief and uh, I have remembered uh, a verse in uh, uh, the Holy Script that uh, blessed be those uh, who grieve because uh, they will be consoled. And thank you very much for um, expressing your ideas because they have given us many insights. And. Uh, uh, this conference is being recorded. Therefore, if you want, you will, we, will, we will have three more interesting presentations at this conference by Yuris Rudevskis, Dr. Yuris Rudevskis, who is not only a lawyer, but also a philosopher and uh, has worked and worked a lot for a long time at the European Human Rights Court. Then Paul Coleman, who is uh, on the front line uh, in the fight of uh, the uh, natural human rights and uh, the concept of uh, the family and the fundamental freedoms in international institutions. And then an exclusive speaker, Katie Faust from the US, uh, who is also uh, the author of uh, uh, books and uh, she specializes in children's rights and uh, the family and marriage uh, the further session will also be very interesting uh, thank you once again and uh, see you soon
I would like to extend uh, cordial thanks to you, Professor Dr. Mazurkevich, and to Professor Bogdan Schlachter. We were really enriched by your participation and presentation, and uh, uh, we hope to someday to hear you again in Lithuania. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you hear me? Oh, hello from all of us. So I have been misgendering you, Eminate. I assumed you were a guy. It's not a problem. Now everything is correct. <laughs> you okay. want me to try to do a screen share? Yeah, that would be great. Perfect. 
Perfect. That's what we wanted to hear. And what is tech support's name? Andrews. Andrews. Andrew. Yeah, Andrew in English. Yeah. Andrew, thank you. I want an Andrew someday. <laughs> I love tech support.
būdina visiems konferencijos dalyvėms ir klausytojams. Na, mes grįžtame atgal po pertraukos į konferencijos antrą dalį ir, kaip jau minėjau, mūsų laukia trys iš tiesų įdomus ir nepaprasti išskirtinių kalbėtojų pranešimai. Good afternoon, welcome back. Let us start the next part of our conference. Uh, we still have uh, three presentations. Uh, I will introduce the first speaker, uh, by, but first I will switch to English. English. Uh, so uh, it's uh, an honor and privilege to uh, introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Yuri Srdevskis, who is um, a lawyer from originally from Latvia, so he's our neighbor uh, in many senses, and he's living and living and working in France. He specializes in European law. Uh, Dr. Yuri Srdevskis defended his doctoral dissertation, uh, the principle of subsidiarity in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights in 2020, and he has a PhD in international law. Uh, Dr. Juris has worked as a lawyer at the Registrar of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, he is an author of numerous articles and comments frequently on legal, philosophical and political issues, and he is uh, really one of the uh, most distinguished experts uh, on the uh, European Conven Convention on Human Rights. And today we have a chance to uh, listen to him, his presentation, uh, uh, which is uh, family and family life in the case law of European Court of Human Rights, definition, recent trends and developments. Dr. Yuris, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for <clears throat> such an excellent presentation. Uh, I will uh, now switch to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so, um, um, so thank you again for inviting me to this conference. Um, my topic today will be family and family life in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights definition, re recent trends and developments. Uh, as you see, uh, my name is Juris Rodevskis. It's easier to remember my first name, Juris. And uh, as you have probably guessed from my first name, I'm a lawyer. As uh, I always say when I'm in France or, or, or in America or in Britain, uh, that is very easy to remember my first name. It's like jurisprudence without prudence. Uh, so um, I will um, immediately start with a general part, with some general remarks. But perhaps uh, in the beginning, I would like to make a disclaimer. It's like a kind of an official mantra that all the views that you are going to hear from me here um, are uh, solely mine, and they do not engage any institutional organization anyway. So I am speaking here in my purely private capacity. And I would like to uh, make uh, some general remarks, important remarks, uh, because as an Aristotelian anatomist, I firmly believe that if uh, you understand the general principles underpinning a subject matter, you have grasped more than a half of this subject matter. And I would like to make five very important general remarks. <clears throat> so the first remark is that we must understand that the European Convention on Human Rights is not a constitution. It is a multilateral international treaty between uh, sovereign states uh, concluded, signed and ratified according to the usual procedures of conclusion uh, of international treaties. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights uh, functions that have been created within the institutional framework of the Council of Europe, 
not the European Union, which is a completely different uh, organization. <clears throat> Unfortunately, some people confuse, but it's not to be confused. It was opened for signature on the 4th of November 1950, came into force in 1953, and it currently has 47 contracting states, which are all the member states without exception of the Council of Europe. And uh, since this event is hosted by the Lithuanian, uh, by the Lithuanian side, I would like to um, remind that it entered into force with respect to Lithuania on 20th of June of 1995. And it has also several additional protocols which form an integral part of the convention itself. So whenever you hear convention, it usually means convention and its additional protocols. Uh, so uh, here you see on the picture the, the building, the current building, of the European Court of Human Rights, the um, uh, called in French Le Palais Européen des Droits de l'Homme. So the European uh, Convention on Human Rights uh, is, uh, so has established a permanent institution, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, uh, in order to ensure the observation of the engagements undertaken by the contracting parties uh, and only that. So Article 19 of the Convention circumscribes the um, competence, the jurisdiction of the European Court of uh, Human Rights. And according to Article 46, uh, Paragraph 1, uh, the judgments uh, delivered by the final judgments delivered by the European Court of Human Rights are binding, uh, uh, but they are, a judgment is binding on the um, contracting party against which it uh, has been delivered. Uh, well, the European Court of Human Rights, uh, since I would say a quarter a century, uh, has repeatedly uh, said in um, its judgments that the convention is a constitutional instrument of, uh, of the European public order. And of course, there are various ways to understand it, but still we must understand that the European Convention on Human Rights is not a constitution, and um, several judges have repeatedly reminded it in their separate opinions that the convention is an international treaty and not a constitution, as for instance, you see in the separate opinion of the Polish judge uh, Krzysztof Wojtyczek. Um, the second remark, uh, very important, is this. Uh, there are two ways of formulating a fundamental rights in a, a constitution, in a domestic constitution or an international agreement. Uh, the first way uh, is what I would call the positivist way, and it's everyone has the right. For instance, it's the European Convention of Human Rights. It says everyone has the right to this or that. And there is another one, which I would call juice naturalist, uh, or um, following the natural law tradition, which says that states shall guarantee the right. And this is the case of, for example, the Constitution of the Republic of Ireland. That's how fundamental rights are expressed in the, in the uh, Constitution of the Republic of Ireland. Or, uh, alternatively, uh, like in the First Amendment uh, to the Constitution of the United States of America, where uh, the formulation, uh, the, the formula used is uh, Congress shall make no law, which is basically the same. Uh, because uh, the problem is that when you say everyone has the right, is an ambiguous formula. Because the next question that immediately arises is whether the statement is descriptive or prescriptive. If it is descriptive, it means that the convention merely protects their rights, but their source is elsewhere. So it might be the will of God. It might be natural rights or natural law. It might be a collective conscience or whatever. It depends on the philosophical uh, paths that, uh, that, that, that you follow. But if uh, we interpret it as a prescriptive um, provision, then it means that the convention itself creates the rights, uh, the rights that are enshrined therein. And in fact, mostly I would say that that's the second interpretation that has uh, prevailed uh, uh, as a prescriptive uh, provision, because look at this um, very blunt statement uh, made by uh, the uh, Portuguese judge, uh, Paulo Pinto de Albuquerque, in his separate opinion, 
one of his separate opinions, where he said, the convention means what the court considers the convention to mean with no further qualifications, full stop. So, so bluntly, just bring it. And uh, that's, uh, um, uh, that's how we see the, um, let's say this, this emerging concept that has been uh, defined by several legal scholars quite some time ago, uh, the concept of legislator which is a portmanteau of judge and legislator, the judge, uh, be it uh, a domestic judge, a judge of the constitutional court or international judge, who actually takes uh, the, actually kind of um, uh, takes upon itself the function of the first power, the, the power of the legislator. <clears throat> the third important uh, remark, which um, normally would justify I think a separate lecture, but we have no time to dwell upon it in depth, is that the convention system is largely self-referential. And uh, here uh, it is uh, basically, uh, you will understand it better perhaps um, if you think of the famous Gödel's first incompleteness theorem uh, about the, um, let's say the uh, underpinning axiomatic principles within um, every, let's say, closed system uh, of uh, postulates or, 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 or values, uh, it is true that sometimes the uh, European Court of Human Rights has referred to, occasionally, to common principles of the European constitutional heritage or such things. But basically, this, is, um, this phenomenon is occasional. Usually, the European Court of Human Rights, in most cases, refers to convention values itself. So, for instance, this behavior is not protected because it goes against the convention values. Convention values means self-referential system, not natural law, not natural rights, not religious commandments, um, nothing similar, just the convention itself. The fourth important remark is this, that uh, there are, uh, in principle, several uh, general theories of uh, interpretation of legal provisions. And uh, two of them, I mean, there are, there are several of them, I will not mention all of them, but two of them which are, let's say, the most uh, famous because they are diametrically opposed to each other is originalism versus living instrument. Originalism, like we have heard very much um, of this, um, uh, this concept from the late uh, Justice Scalia, a member of the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. So he was originalist. Uh, he um, <clears throat> uh, referred to original meaning and the textual meaning of the US Constitution. Uh, but the, what is important is that in the United States, in the Supreme Court of the United States of America, there is a permanent tension between these two theories, how to interpret the, the, the Constitution as a living instrument or as it was intended in the beginning. So there is this tension and you know which judges, which justices are, uh, are originalists and which are proponents of the theory of the living instrument. And there is uh, nothing even remotely similar in the system of the European Convention on Human Rights because the European Court of Human Rights has already made the choice once and for all in favor of one of these sides, one of these theories, and it was uh, it goes back to 1978 in the famous case of Tyra against the United Kingdom concerning uh, corporal punishments administered to minors in the Isle of Man, uh, Tyra against the United Kingdom, and the, the, the court clearly said that uh, the convention is a living instrument which must be interpreted in the light of present day conditions. So matter is, the matter is closed, so there is no tension. Uh, according to the European Court of Human Rights, the only legitimate way to look at the convention is the living instrument doctrine or uh, also known as uh, evolutive interpretation. And now I come to the last, to the fifth uh, general remark, which is perhaps the most important, uh, let's say uh, in the context of our conversation today. It is what I would call uh, axiological asymmetry, and you, you'll see what I mean by, 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 by this expression. Now, 
when deciding on um, any case, I mean, on and especially on private or family life cases under Article 8 of the Convention, you will see that later in a minute, uh, the court recognizes that domestic authorities uh, have a more or less wide margin of appreciation in assessing where, where the, the, that the interference was necessary or not. And the margin of appreciation, it's an expression that you will not find in the convention. It's been coined by the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. And the margin of appreciation is based on the idea that the uh, domestic authorities, and especially and singularly the domestic courts, uh, which are closer to the domestic uh, circumstances, the factual, legal, traditional, economic, and other circumstances, are by definition in a better position to assess the necessity of an interference. But it is true that the breadth of the margin of appreciation may be uh, very different. It may vary depending on the subject matter and the relevant circumstances of the case. For instance, the European Court of Human Rights has said that uh, concerning the freedom of expression, that's just one uh, example out of a myriad, is that if, uh, there, if it's a political expression, like political debate, so the margin of appreciation to restrict it for domestic authorities is very narrow. Nevertheless, uh, there is no margin of appreciation concerning definitions, and that's very important, no margin of appreciation concerning definitions. So there is no margin of appreciation in determining whether there is family life in the uh, uh, first place in each individual case. And uh, in determining, in assessing the way in which the European Court of Human Rights sets the breadth of the margin of appreciation left to the national authorities, we must realize that there are some moral and axiological presuppositions underpinning the court's reasoning in some categories of cases. This, uh, I mean, se sensitive cases, and either expanding or narrowing the margin of appreciation. And no democratic dissent is allowed. In the me, in, in the, what I mean by that is that uh, even if the uh, member state uh, in question says, but in our country, the absolute majority of society has an opposite view, uh, it does not outweigh the court's assessment. So these moral and axiological presuppositions, um, I, I have called them sometimes in my previous uh, publications as sacred cows. You can call them ideological uh, hypervalues or supervalues, but I think the most elegant uh, way uh, to call it is really sacred cows. And one of them uh, concerns the LGBT, the issues uh, uh, connected with LGBT. So, Look at this case, for instance, in the case of Bayev against Russia, uh, quite a famous case covered by media, both in Russia and abroad. It concerned the legislative ban on uh, propaganda of non-traditional sexual relations aimed at minors, <clears throat> uh, um, defined as regulatory offense uh, by uh, Russian, uh, both at the federal level and at the um, uh, at the level of the, uh, let's say, subjects of the Federation, as they call it. And the European Court of Human Rights um, uttered such a very important formula. It said, in order to reply to the government's observations justifying the necessity of uh, uh, protecting the minors, uh, it said this, the court observes that the Code of Administrative Offenses specifically bans promoting the attractiveness of non-traditional sexual relationships, creating a distorted image of the social equivalence of traditional and non-traditional sexual relationships. That's a quote. In concert with the Constitutional Court's position, the legislation at hand thus states the inferiority of same-sex relationships compared with opposite-sex relationships. And the court has already found that the legislative provisions in question embodied a predisposed bias on the part of the heterosexual majority against the homosexual 
minority. So the idea is this, to uh, say, for, let's say to reformulate it in an objective way, is that the European Court of Human Rights does not allow the states to have a different moral assessment, a different moral opinion on the LGBT issues than itself. Granted, the European Court of Human Rights has recognized this right to individuals uh, under Article 9 of the Convention, freedom of thought, and Article 10, freedom of expression, but not to the state in order to justify a, a limitation to these rights. And uh, I invite you to read the dissenting opinion of uh, Judge uh, Dmitry Dedov, the Russian judge, as well as the uh, judgment in the case of Vedeland and others against Sweden, where, on the contrast, because I forgot to say it, of course, in the case of Bayev, the, the European Court of Human Rights found a violation of um, Article 10, freedom of expression, together with Article 14, discrimination, prohibition of discrimination. But in the case of Vedeland against uh, Sweden, it validated the conviction of uh, several Swedish youths for circulating, uh, so to speak, homophobic leaflets at, at school. So the margin of appreciation is very wide to defend the, the whole LGBT thing, so to speak, but it is very na narrow uh, if the state wants to limit it. Uh, it has been partially also highlighted by the Slovenian judge Zupancic in his separate opinion. So now um, uh, let us see the specific points regarding family, uh, uh, family and family life. What I'm going to say now, what uh, you are going to hear now, of course, it is a very general overview of the general principles of the court's case law, because this case law is very abundant. It's far from being exhaustive, but some important points. Uh, so the right to respect for private and family life um, is guaranteed by Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. So this, the second paragraph uh, grants the state the right to, uh, to, to uh, um, let's say, to apply some limitations to it. Also, uh, other relevant provisions are Article 12 of the Convention, the right to marry and to found a family. Uh, this the provision is uh, unique because Unlike other provisions which say everyone has the right, here it says the men and women of marriageable age, because so the, the main subject of this right is not an individual, but a couple. And it's important to note that in the famous case of Schalk and Kopf against Austria, the court said that this article does not impose an obligation for the state to legalize a same-sex marriage. Also, uh, what is important, but perhaps less, less important in, in our today's context, is, the, uh, is Article 2 of Protocol uh, Number 1, the right to education, which guarantees the parents um, the right uh, to have their philosophical and religious opinions respected. Uh, and uh, Article 14, which is very important, Article 14 uh, prohibits discrimination uh, based on, uh, and there, uh, th th there is a list, an enumeration of, um, uh, of, of various grounds of discrimination, such as sex, race, uh, and so on. But this list is not exhaustive because it says any other status. And the European Court of Human Rights has said that, as it was a long time ago already, in 1999, the court said that other status includes sexual orientation too. Uh, so, and uh, Article 1 of Protocol Number 12 extends the same principle of non-discrimination uh, to any right set forth by domestic law. If Article 14 applies only to the convention rights, so Article 1, Protocol Number 12 applies it to, extends it to any right, but, uh, but anyway, uh, this protocol has not been ratified by all the member states. Now, uh, uh, so here is, here is the, perhaps the most important point of my talk today is that the European Court of Human Rights has not defined what a family is. And this is something that legal scholars and sometimes domestic courts, including constitutional courts, get completely wrong because the European Court of Human Rights has not given a definition or even a, even a set of criteria to define what a family is. Even if the court does occasionally use the term family in its reasoning, it prefers speaking of family life rather than family. 
And why? Of course, it's obvious. Family life is much wider because family, by definition, what is a family? Family is a structure, while family life is a relationship or a connection. The European Court of Human Rights um, says that the notion of family life within the convention is an autonomous concept. It means that it does not uh, depend on the definition of this concept in the domestic law. So the convention, the, the, the court uh, does not depend on the domestic definition. So they, the court is free to define it for the purposes of the convention. And basically it decides whether there is family life on a case by case uh, basis and let's say the only criteria which is quite vague is a real existence in practice of close personal uh, ties. And, it, and it's important also to note that Article 1 in principle applies to, uh, sorry, Article 8 applies to actual, that is existing family relations. It presupposes the existence of a family. Conversely, it does not guarantee the right to found a family or the right to adopt for that purpose. And uh, in some cases, of course, the boundaries of the concept of personal, of uh, family life have been extended by the court also to potential relationship, but um, provided that there are at least some actual elements of a real tangible uh, personal tie. Uh, so uh, let's have, have a quick overview of what the European Court of Human Rights considers as family life. Family life, remember, family life rather than family. A relationship that arises from a genuine marriage, according to the domestic law. Um, cohabitation out of wedlock, even if there is no marriage, but a co stable cohabitation. Uh, sometimes a stable union may be sufficient to establish the existence of family life, even if there is no cohabitation. It really depends on the particular circumstances of the case. But it is important that Article 8 does not create an obligation to grant special legal recognition to de facto families and relationships. So, as the court has said, um, in the case of Babiaj against Poland, uh, a, uh, if the domestic uh, legal system does not provide for a link other than marriage, then in principle there is no right under the convention to ask that the state uh, create uh, a kind of legal cohabitation. Um, relationship between parents and children, uh, of course a child born of a marital relationship, also a putative child of a father who was deemed to be a biological father but then suddenly uh, after some DNA tests turned out not to be one but if there is, if, um, let's say uh, uh, over, over some years there is an established link between them as a father and a child, it's protected as a family life. Also a potential relationship between a child born out of wedlock and his or her natural father. Adoption, of course, it's, it's, it, it, it uh, comes under the definition of uh, uh, family life because according to the famous uh, Roman legal maxim, adoptio natura mimitatur, adoption imitates nature. Uh, and uh, the relationship that arises from a lawful or genuine adoption, or perhaps an adoption pronounced abroad, but not recognized in the domestic legal system, it is still, it uh, belongs to the sphere of um, family life. In some cases, foster families, even foster families can, um, uh, relationships within foster families can be uh, considered as constituting, uh, constituting a, uh, a genuine family life. And also, in principle, but I will not re go further um, for the lack of time, but, but, but in many circumstances, uh, relationships between grandpa, parents, siblings, and so on also belong to the sphere of family life. Now, concerning same-sex relationships, um, the court has said that a same-sex couple living in a stable relationship within the notion of, uh, actually falls both within the notion of family life and within the notion of private life in the same way as a heterosexual uh, couple. And the court justified it in the, in the case of Schalkenkopf against Austria, the same case where it said that there was no right uh, to 
to say same-sex marriage as such, it said this. It is artificial to maintain uh, the view that in contrast to a different uh, sex couple, a same-sex couple could not enjoy family life for the purposes of Article 8. So consequently, the relationship of the applicants, a cohabiting same-sex couple living in a stable de facto part partnership, fell within the notion of family life, just as the relationship of a different sex couple in the same situation would. Remember my earlier remark that uh, from the axiological point of view, the European Court of Human Rights does not recognize the legitimacy of a state position according to which, um, let's say, the, the same-sex relations are uh, something negative or something bad. And the European Court of Human Rights very often uses the concept of an emerging European consensus towards legal recognition of same-sex couples, which has developed rap rapidly over the past decades in Europe. Uh, and um, um, I will uh, now mention three more cases. Uh, in the case of Valianatos and others against Greek, uh, Greece, the court said that it was a discrimination prohibited by Article 14 to create a civil unions, not marriage, but civil cohabitation for different sex couples only, but not, for, say, not to extend it to same-sex couples. In a case of Oliari against Italy, uh, the uh, court said that the absence of a specific legal framework providing for the recognition and protection of the same-sex unions in the specific circumstances of Italy, because in Italy the constitutional court has said that actually the, legis the legislator had to do it, uh, was a violation of Article 8, is a failure to comply with uh, positive obligations under Article 8. And finally, in the case of Orlandi and others, um, following Oliari, the court said that um, it was a violation of Article 8 not to register same-sex marriages contracted abroad, but not necessarily in the form of a marriage, but it could have been under another form, but in fact there was, the court said that it was like a legal vacuum uh, for same-sex couples. Uh, so violation of Article 8, positive obligations. So, and I will finish by saying that um, even if there is no family life, Article 8 might still be applicable under its private life head, which is much, much wider. Because for the purposes of Article 8, uh, in the case of the court, private life has gradually become a sort of general clause encompassing an extremely wide variety of rights. You can even, you can even not imagine how wide it is. And as an epilogue uh, to, to, to my talk, I would like to quote a separate opinion of uh, the Lithuanian judge, uh, Mr. Egidius Kouris, in the case of Ermeni against Hungary, where the uh, European Court of Human Rights held that even the right to continue to occupy a specific position within, within a country's superior courts was protected by private life. And he said that, you see, he said, I, I, I just made a copy for you. He said that the perspective of examining privacy in terms of the right and value protected by Article 8 must be returned to its natural angle. So graphically, 8 should be indeed seen as 8 and not as increasingly tends to be the case, like a sign of infinity, which is uh, actually the attitude of the European Court of Human Rights uh, right now. And that's really the last one. Uh, so um, I might say, well, my opinion is that the court will pursue this path uh, towards a greater recognition, like obliging the states to recognize same-sex cohabitation in, in, in various ways. So this might just my private opinion, uh, because the um, because underpinning uh, many of the crucial judgments of the European Court of Human Rights is the idea of linear progress. And in uh, 2014, I published an article, I actually gave a lecture and, and then later published an article, you can uh, see it on the screen, it's available online, on the idea of linear progress in modern legal reasoning, example of the European Court of Human Rights. So I trace it back to William of Ockham, and nominalists and, and, and a voluntarist school. So if you're interested, you might uh, read it. Thank you very much for your attention. 
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yuris uh, Lelspaldis, for your excellent presentation and for uh, explaining important distinctions, uh, which are very relevant in uh, our contemporary context here in Lithuania, uh, uh, in the context of uh, political debates uh, concerning uh, providing legal status for uh, other than uh, men and women couples, legal status of family. So uh, once more, thank you very much. And uh, as in the first session, we will have a time at the end of this uh, uh, session uh, to uh, have possibility to answer to the questions of um, listeners, of participants of conference. And I just remind uh, everybody that uh, you have a chance to right uh, in the uh, section of chat uh, in the uh, YouTube uh, channel uh, your questions and uh, of course we don't have uh, possibility to ask all questions because of limited time but uh, it's a chance that at least uh, one of your question will be asked uh, so again thank you very much uh, Dr. Yuris and uh, now I have a pleasure to introduce uh, person which I admire and respect very much, uh, a brave and uh, wise person who defends actually all of us against encroaching uh, of our and suppressing of our rights. It's Paul Coleman from United Kingdom originally, but actually he is now uh, residing in uh, Austria in Vienna. He's a solicitor of the senior courts of England and Wales and is the author of two books and numerous articles. Uh, his uh, last book, Censored, addresses the race of so-called hate speech laws throughout Europe and, and uh, their devastating effect on freedom of speech. Paul Coleman special, special, specializes in international human rights and European law and has been involved in more than 20 cases before the European Court of Human Rights. He has authorized uh, or authored complaints and uh, submissions to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, International Criminal Court, Court of Justice of the European Union, United Nations Human Rights Committee and numerous national courts. Paul Coleman is the executive director of uh, Alliance Defending Freedom International, International from its headquarters in Vienna. And today we have an opportunity to hear a presentation of uh, Paul, uh, which is redefining marriage and family and the crushing of dissent. Paul, floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for that warm introduction. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all today, and um, I'm really grateful for the invitation to this conference. Now, our leaders talk about being a diverse, inclusive, and tolerant society, welcoming of all. And these values are heralded above all others, but this is increasingly being revealed as nothing more than a myth and very often the exact opposite of reality. Instead, we see, at least in the West, uh, ruling elites telling us the right way and the wrong way to think about an ever-growing number of issues. And relevant for today's discussion, the right way and the wrong way to think about the institution of marriage and the family and what it means to even be male and female. Everything today has become politicized and the window or the corridor of acceptable opinion on any given issue now is extremely narrow. And the reality is, if you find yourself on the wrong side of these debates, then you're often labeled as a bigot. You must be therefore silenced and perhaps even punished. There is no diversity for your views. You're not to be included. You're not to be tolerated. So across Europe today, we have vaguely worded and arbitrarily enforced codes of conduct adopted by big tech without any real discussion or any public consultation. These codes are constantly changed to suit whatever political position the platform wants to take, as we've seen 
in the last year, in the last few weeks in particular. National governments are introducing more hate speech laws and have started threatening online social media platforms with crippling fines if they don't censor speech. And many leading universities across the continent are banning speakers and silencing their students. So not exactly what I think about when I think of the true meanings of the words like diversity, inclusion, and tolerance. And now, today, it is very well documented that when it comes to the question of marriage and family and redefining these terms, once this threshold is crossed in law, then dissent will no longer be tolerated for those who hold their traditional views. So in the time that I have today, I want to outline five areas where freedom is undermined across Europe when marriage is redefined in law. So the first area is in the workplace. Anyone involved in work relating to marriage and relationships faces significant pressure once marriage is redefined. If they seek to hold to the traditional view of marriage and act accordingly. In some cases, failure to conform has resulted in the termination of employment. For example, in the UK, Lynn Ladelli was forced to leave her job as a marriage registrar after years of service for choosing to act on her Christian conscience. Similarly, UK Christian relationship therapist Gary McFarlane was dismissed for gross misconduct because he only wanted to work with married couples. Both of these people took their case to the European Court of Human Rights. I was involved in these cases and both of them lost. Any number of other sectors are vulnerable to this process too, if you dare voice your opinion on the subject. So for example, a few years ago, a housing manager called Adrian Smith was demoted. He had his salary reduced by 40% simply for posting his views on marriage on his personal Facebook page. And then in the US, uh, it was discovered that Brendan Eich, he was the CEO and the founder of the big internet company Mozilla. And it was discovered that he had donated a small amount of his private income in defending marriage in California. He was immediately forced to resign. And as a columnist for the New York Times explained at the time, he said, and I quote, even those who argued that Mr. Ike should stay on as chief executive worried that his stance would reduce the company's ability to attract people to their mission. And he was this company's founder. Well, these examples increase with each passing year. So number one, the workplace. Number two, the marketplace, because businesses are also under threat of being sued and ultimately close down if they do not conform. That includes bakers, florists, photographers, guest houses, wedding venues, printing companies, amongst many others. If these business owners and creative professionals decline to promote or celebrate a message with which they disagree, they're often dragged to the court. Sometimes the police are even called. And the message of all of these cases is pretty clear. It goes like this. If you hold to the traditional view of marriage, then don't run a business involving marriages or relationships. And even on the rare occasion that the courts find in the business owner's favor, which can happen, even so, they face years of costly and all-consuming lawsuits. A couple of examples. In the UK, the case involving Asher's Bakery from Northern Ireland continues now into its eighth year. Uh, this involved a very small Christian bakery that refused to decorate a cake with a political message on marriage that they couldn't support and they, they refused to print. Eight years. And in the US, um, Jack Phillips of Masterpiece Cake Shop won a landmark case at the US Supreme Court, that my colleagues defended him before the court and won this amazing case. And yet, because he declined to um, create certain messages that went against his beliefs, even though he won that case, he remains now in litigation to this day, nine years later. 
So that's the workplace, the marketplace. Thirdly, the public square, because free speech is also under significant threat in the public square once we redefine in law marriage and the family. So, for example, leading church figures from a number of different countries across Europe have been investigated by the police and taken to court for sermons or interviews that mention the church's teaching on human sexuality and marriage. And I'd like to focus for a moment not on a church leader, but on a political leader on the case of Pavi Rizanen in nearby Finland. We're helping to support Mrs. Rosanen in her case. And here are the basic facts. Rosanen is a trained medical doctor. She's a highly experienced member of the Finnish parliament. She served there for the past 25 years, including as a senior government minister. She's also a member of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland and serves on her local parish council. Well, in the summer of 2019, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Finland announced that it would become an official partner of Helsinki Pride 2019. So as an active member of her church, Rosanen shared a post on social media directed at her church's leadership. It showed an image of a Bible passage and questioned the church's partnership with Pride in light of official church teaching on marriage and sexuality. There were no threats of violence, no slurs, no obscenity, not even a mention of anyone in particular. It was an innocuous tweet aimed at her church's leadership. Well, this tweet triggered a police investigation. She was suspected of ethnic agitation under Finland's typically broad hate speech law. She was questioned for hours by the police and the case against her is still ongoing now as we move into 2021. And then she faced a second police interrogation, this time for a short booklet that she wrote over 16 years ago that explains the church's teaching on marriage and sexuality. This booklet was written before the law that she's being charged under was even passed. And since then, two further police investigations have been launched in relation to media interviews that Rosanen has done. So just to repeat, in a nearby country of Lithuania, a quietly spoken 60 year old grandmother of six, who's been a member of the Finnish parliament since 1995, is facing four criminal investigations. And if found guilty, she could face up to two years in prison per offense. And that is all for um, upholding and speaking out on the biblical teaching of marriage and sexuality. And honestly, as a lawyer working full time defending freedom of speech for the past decade, I can say with certainty that there are many other cases popping up across Europe today just like this, many of which are related to the issue we're discussing, discussing today, that of marriage. So we've looked at the workplace, the marketplace, the public square, fourthly, access to services. Because increasingly, it's becoming difficult for those who hold to the traditional view of marriage to access certain services otherwise available to the public. And the logic of it goes like this. If the traditional view of marriage is so intolerant and bigoted, then why should it be given a platform at all? And this is how our British Prime Minister Boris Johnson put it a few years ago when Mayor of London, he said, we should be intolerant of intolerance. That's the logic. So a few years ago, several organizations attempted to host a conference on the legal definition of marriage at the Law Society in London. And the conference was entitled One Man, One Woman. And that was the legal definition of marriage at the time being hosted at the Law Society. However, the Law Society cancelled the booking at the last minute, claiming that it breached their diversity policy. Other venues have cancelled similar events or face significant pressure to do so all over the world. But when it comes to accessing services, I think it's clear to all of us that the battle is fiercest in the digital space. Google, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft and many other big tech firms all filed a legal brief at the US Supreme Court pushing for 
the redefinition of marriage in that country. And they're at the very forefront of this whole movement. And as many news stories confirm, together with their ever evolving terms of service, which speak for themselves, these companies are becoming increasingly intolerant of any dissent. And here's why this is so important. Google is, in effect, the world's largest media company. It has an 88% market share in search advertising. Facebook, including Instagram and WhatsApp, controls over 70% of social media. And some of you may have followed the current news story taking place in Australia right now. Essentially, the Australian parliament is debating a law that Facebook doesn't like. And to punish the government, Facebook decided simply to block users from accessing or posting links to all news sites in Australia. This is an extraordinary development for a private company to take an action like this against an elected government. In essence, the second that these companies want to block something or prevent access to these services, they can do so at the click of a button. They can deplatform sitting presidents. They can blockade entire countries. And it becomes even more complicated and infinitely more difficult when we think about the infrastructure behind these platforms, the app stores, the devices, the internet itself. For example, Amazon Web Services, AWS, it's rarely talked about, but it completely dominates the modern day cloud-based internet. So if you like a certain website and you rely on it each day, there is a very good chance it's being hosted by AWS servers. It is everywhere and it's powering this Zoom call as I speak. And that means if Amazon decided a group or a company violated its ever-changing rules, it could simply prevent you from using its services. It's already doing this. When the app Parler, which was marketed as the free speech alternative to Twitter, was blamed for its role in the Washington DC riots back in January, it was, all, it was immediately blocked from AWS. It was effectively closed down with just a few clicks. That was the end. Well, how does it all relate to this topic? Well, it should be obvious, the principle in play here is that these companies feel they have an obligation to stop things like misinformation, hate speech, and discrimination. And they get to define these terms. And those who believe in marriage are accused of being haters and discriminators. However much you may object to those labels and attempt to explain why your understanding of marriage isn't hateful or discriminatory, but is loving and is good for society. It doesn't matter if the other side gets to define what is misinformation, what is hate speech, what is discrimination. So how long will it be until almost every corner of the internet becomes inaccessible to those who hold and share such views? And perhaps this sounds all very dramatic, but it really is happening before our very eyes. The fifth and final area to discuss briefly is that of churches and charities, private associations. So we're beginning to see the impact now that redefining marriage is having in this area. And it's a near certainty that once a country redefines marriage in law, then charities that do not conform to this new definition will, will lose public funding. If they're receiving it, they'll lose it. For example, Catholic adoption agencies have been forced to close in some countries because once those countries redefined marriage, these adoption agencies were seen as being discriminatory and operating policies against the law of the land. But there's even a possibility that charities that don't receive any public funding will come under pressure if they hold to the traditional view of marriage. For example, days after the US Supreme Court redefined marriage, Mark Oppenheimer wrote in Time magazine that, quote, organizations that dissent from settled public policy should have their tax exempt status abolished or greatly diminished. 
after all, the logic goes, why should these dissenters, these bigots, be allowed to run charities with certain tax breaks? So there is the strong likelihood that if things continue along their current course, not only will these charities face increasing pressure, but churches may eventually be forced to conform or to face the consequences. So let me conclude. Throughout this talk, I have been talking about redefining marriage. And someone might say to this, yeah, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is introducing civil unions. But let me just say this. There are 16 countries in Europe that have redefined marriage in law. All 16 countries began this process by introducing some form of civil union. It is basically a step in that direction. And on average, the overwhelming pressure to convert these unions into the full redefinition of marriage takes place in less than 10 years. Once that happens, once a country redefines marriage, then those who hold to the traditional view of marriage begin to be labelled as bigots and their views are shut out of public life. Fundamental freedoms that we ought to cherish, including freedom of religion, freedom of speech and freedom of association are greatly impacted. And we're just a few years into this fast moving process. So if things follow the current trajectory, then more freedom will be lost in the future. Now, you may well still choose as a nation to go down this path, but please don't do so on the basis that nothing will really change and that there are no real consequences for those who hold to the traditional view of marriage, because there are consequences and they are significant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Paul, for your uh, very much uh, Im very important and timely presentation, uh, which provides us a better understanding of uh, dangerous trends. And actually, your presentation is very relevant for us here in Lithuania because, um, paradoxically, but uh, the most radical liberal party has in its agenda restrictions on uh, uh, of uh, free speech. Uh, based or grounded in the expansion of the notion of hate speech. So uh, your insights and uh, helps us really to understand uh, better and actually also better prepare for what can come to us, all of us. And uh, thank you very much for all your work you do for defending freedom of speech. And uh, uh, our conference today is not only international, but I would say it's also global. Uh, we have one speaker from the other side of Atlantic. And uh, uh, right now here in Lithuania, we already have evening, but uh, in the United States, uh, there is still early morning. And uh, I have a, a great pleasure to introduce our uh, last speaker of the session and of the conference, but as it's uh, popular to say, uh, last but not the least, uh, it's Katie Faust from United States of uh, America. She's the founder and director of the Children's Rights Organization, uh, which is the name is Them Before Us. Uh, Katie Faust is the co-author of the book, Them Before Us, Why We Need a global children's rights movement, which flips the script on adult-centric attitudes toward marriage, parenthood, and reproductive technologies by framing these issues around a child's right to be raised by both their mother and father. She has authored several amicus briefs uh, defending children's rights. Katie Faust is uh, the Washington Center leader for Kana Vox. So it's a great uh, uh, pleasure and honor, Katie, to have you among us here in Lithuania in our conference. And uh, uh, we would uh, 
great interest will uh, listen uh, your presentation, uh, which is uh, the rights of children must determine family policy. Floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and I'm so grateful for Juris. You laid all the legal foundation. And um, for Paul, who kind of um, detailed the religious liberty concerns around these issues. So I want to look at this from another perspective, and that is the rights of the child. Um, so I'm going to start a screen share here. Slowly. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about children's rights. You in Europe have a somewhat of an advantage over us Americans when talking about this, because all of you are or should be familiar with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, this should be part of your national lexicon, especially in Lithuania. Um, you ratified this in 1991, but this spells out, you know, right after a child's right to life, they have a, they have a right to be known and loved by both of their biological parents. And so I wanna talk with you about the power of this natural right, and then the kind of implications that it should have for family policy. So why are these natural rights so powerful? Um, we're gonna talk about three different reasons. The first one is biological identity, that these two adults offer something that no other adults can to children, and it is their biological identity. Um, second, these two adults happen to be statistically the safest adults in a child's life. And third, when we honor this fundamental child right, it comes with the benefit of offering the perfect gender balance each time. So, biological identity. So, Biological identity matters to children. Um, and while you may not necessarily understand it, when you are just thinking about your own life, maybe you grew up with both of your parents, so you haven't had a chance to confront the importance of biological reality in your life. We know that biological identity matters to children because we have seen adoptees and donor conceived children, children conceived through sperm and egg donation, um, grapple with the loss of their biological and kinship bonds. Um, we've seen adoptees struggling with identity issues. Um, the term genealogical bewilderment was coined back in the 60s, where children wrestle with like, who am I? Where do I belong? Where did I get these features? Who am I connected to? All these kids are asking the question, who am I? And where do I belong? And it's hard to answer those questions outside or if you've been separated from one or both of your biological parents. Um, of children surveyed, children who are created through sperm donation, two thirds agree with the statement, my sperm donor is half of who I am. And in the United States, there has been a drastic shift away from closed adoptions, um, where there was no contact between the birth family and the adopted child and towards open adoptions. So now 95% of adoptions in the United States are open or have some degree of contact because social workers have recognized that children benefit from as many connections with their first family as possible. So this is um, a quote from one woman who was conceived through sperm donation and raised by loving heterosexual parents. Um, she said, I cannot describe what it feels like. So she found, she, she went on the search like so many children do um, who are created through sperm and egg donation. And she searched until she found her donor, which most donor conceived children just consider to be their biological father or their biological mother. Um, she says, I cannot describe what it feels like to see your father's face for the first time. In that moment, I became whole. The lopsided, half-empty feeling I had every day of my life was suddenly filled. I was whole and complete person for the first time in my life. I'm not the same person I was. I am whole. I have my identity. So what she's saying is she did not just need to be safe and loved by the two people who raised her. Her biological parent, her biological donor, had something to offer her that her loving parents could not provide and that she desperately craved. Second, this is a powerful child right because statistically, 
A child's biological mother and father are the safest adults in a child's life. Um, Child Trends, which is a left-leaning research site, says research clearly demonstrates that family structure matters for children and that family the family structure that helps children the most is a family headed by two biological parents in a low conflict marriage. Children in single parent families, children born to unmarried mothers, children in step families or cohabiting relationships face higher risks of poor outcomes than other children outside of the biological married family. This is one chart um, drawn from government data that outlines some of the risks to children. Now, by no means are we saying that all stepfathers or stepmothers or boyfriends or girlfriends or partners are abusive or neglectful. But as you can see from the data, that there is one family structure that puts children at the lowest risk and it is the home where both of their natural rights to both of their parents has been respected and protected. And that's the married biological family that you see down on the bottom left. Um, then we look at single parents where the risks, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and physical abuse increase. We move on to unmarried biological parents. So even if you are living with both biological parents, but there is, um, they're cohabiting, you still have increased risks of abuse. Then a child living with neither parent um, other married parents. And then finally, at the very end, you see single parent with partner and the risk of abuse skyrockets. In fact, if you Google the words mother's boyfriend, you will know what I'm talking about um, because an unrelating cohabiting man is statistically the most dangerous person in a child's life. So when we're talking about family structure, um, any two will not do. Studies show that children with stepfathers on average fare about as well as children of single mothers. So it's not a situation where you can swap in or out any adult and have it be unaffected for the child. There's something distinct when it comes to safety and well being for children that only happens in the home of their married mother and father. Um, in this family, conversation, you're probably going to run up against a lot of conversations to the effect of, well, children don't need moms and dads, they just need to be safe and loved. And then you can say, well, congratulations, you just said that children need married mothers and fathers, because statistically, that is the very place where they are most likely to be safe and loved. One woman um, wrote this, her father had left the family, and then her mother remarried. And this is her story. She says, my mom remarried a couple of years after my bio dad left. The man she married took on four kids that were not his own. Unfortunately, he was often verbally abusive, ill-tempered and reactionary. My mom was put in the position of protecting us almost daily. My stepfather and my mother ended up having three children together as well. And I saw my stepfather turn into a loving, adoring biological father. He was a different changed man towards his own children. Now, I know some heroic step parents that are filling in for a missing biological parent, um, but they are the exception. The rule is that the biological parent is the most connected to, protective of, and invested in children. And there is no statistical case to be made to the contrary. Next, gender balance. The incredible thing about honoring this fundamental child right is that when you do, children will automatically get the paternal love and the maternal love that is optimal for child development. Um, mothers and fathers are different. Men and women are different. And we see those differences demonstrated most powerfully in the family. And children are the primary beneficiaries of that. Um, many experts believe that they're so different are the ways that men and women interact with children that there is no such thing as parenting. There's only mothering and fathering and kids need both. Men don't mother and women don't father. Mothers and fathers uh, parent differently, play differently, communicate differently, discipline dif differently. They prepare children for life differently. And the incredible thing about having a same sex and opposite sex um, 
parent in your household is every child has a picture of who they're going to become as an adult. And they also get a picture of the kind of person that they should seek out in a spouse. So the gender balance is, is critical for child well-being and development. Uh, one woman who was raised by two moms talks about the father hunger that often results. So um, the problem with being, one of the problems of being raised in a same sex headed household is that even if you have two loving adults caring for the child, um, the child still longs to be loved by that missing father or that missing mother. And at them before us, we call that mother hunger or father hunger. Children are hungry for it. And two moms or 10 moms can never be a father. And it's something that every child longs for. So this is what one woman who was created through sperm donation and raised by two women had to say. She said, my mom's family motto was smile and pretend to be happy, but I didn't feel happy every time I came home from a friend's house and saw how different it was. My best friend's dad was the greatest guy. He was funny and nice and always taking us places. He listened to us. I was jealous of my friend and wrote the word daddy on a piece of paper and I put it under my pillow. I wanted a daddy like my friend had. So we, as a society, um, have actually experienced father loss and mother loss since time began. Um, we used to lose fathers on a mass scale. Uh, for example, after war, women used to routinely die in childbirth, but thanks to modern warfare and modern medicine, um, those losses are minimal these days. However, <laughs> Now, the reasons that children are losing their mother and father is not because of tragedy, it's because of intentionality. Now, children are losing their mother and father because adult desires are being prioritized above their fundamental rights. And we have two different re reactions to this, right? When a child loses their parent to tragedy, we encircle the child and we mourn with them. We allow them to remember their parent. We are sad with them. And we all recognize that this is a tragedy. Children these days who are losing their right to their mother or father because an adult desire is being prioritized above their rights, we are, we are telling them this is progress. When the reality is, it's an injustice. So let's look at some of the ways that children's rights to their mother and father are being threatened today. Um, the redefinition of marriage is probably the one that is the most prominent in terms of its um, it's steady march through the different nations of the world. Um, Adult-centric adoption, the idea that adults should have a right to adopt. Um, Intent-based parented laws is now moving full steam ahead in the wake of the redefinition of marriage here in the United States. The normalization of polygamy and polyamory. Um, the widespread acceptance of no-fault divorce that has been unfortunately um, a very steady presence in the United States for decades single mothers by choice that's um, building on the reproductive technologies, surrogacy, the normalization of surrogacy and the promotion of surrogacy, sperm and egg donation, declining marriage rates um, are a huge problem and the cohabitation that goes along with that, the promotion of same-sex parenthood, the idea that two moms or two dads can be on a birth certificate. So really every question about marriage and family ultimately come down to the same thing. And that is, are you honoring or are you disregarding the rights of children? So let's look at a few of these issues, the ones that I think are most pressing for Europe today. So what we try to do at Them Before Us is we say all of these issues about marriage and family, um, you probably know this as well, tend to be obsessively focused on what adults want. Adult desire drives the narrative in all of these issues and all of these questions. And so we're used to thinking about all of these issues in terms of what the adults want. But the reality is all of them are just different manifestations of disregarding the rights of children. So let's take a look at a few of these issues. First, we're going to look at the us before them, the adults before the children mindset. And then we're gonna take a look at what this looks like when we put the children before the adults. And let's take a look at the contrast, because what I hope that you come away with after this presentation is the recognition that if you can honor the rights of children, if you take that children have a right to their mother and father template, you can lay it over the top of any of these marriage and family questions and come out with good policy. 
So the definition of marriage, the world says the adult centric version of this, the us before them definition is any two consenting adults can be married. But the them before us version of marriage goes like this. Marriage is the only adult relationship that unites the two people to whom children have a natural right. While not every marriage produces children, every child has a mother and father. Traditional marriage is society's best shot at ensuring children are raised by both. And that's why it deserves special recognition and protection. Marriage historically has been the most child-friendly institution the world has ever known because of this child-centric focus. When we redefine marriage, we turn it in just into another vehicle of adult fulfillment. Um, and there's already plenty of those. Same-sex marriage, okay. Same-sex marriage says love is love, right? There's no difference. Two men can love one another, two women can love one another, a man and woman can love each other, it doesn't matter. The them before us response to that is, redefining marriage redefines parenthood. We already know what happens to parenthood laws when marriage is redefined into a genderless institution. When husbands and wives are optional in marriage, mothers and fathers become optional in parenthood. Marriage laws should reflect children's natural right to be raised by their mother and father. We uh, spend some time in our new book detailing all the different ways that all the many of the countries that have redefined marriage have then subsequently gone on to weaken the rights of children. And that's how it works. Once you redefine marriage, everywhere that gay marriage goes, the rights of children to their own mother and father are diluted and weakened or completely ignored. And that's an injustice. Sperm and egg donation. What the world says about this is sometimes people need help to get pregnant. I mean, look at these adults. They're struggling. They desire a child. They're infertile. They would be such great parents. This is the way that we can help them. But the children's rights response to that is using the gamut, using the sperm or the egg of a third party is unjust because it intentionally denies children a relationship with their mother or father, regardless of whether the intended parents are single or married or gay or straight. Third party reproduction violates children's rights. What this does when we be in with the, if you look at this from the adult's perspective, usually it's in the context of, we desperately want a child. We want a biological connection to our, we don't want to adopt because we want a biological connection to our child. And the only way to do that is to use a sperm donor or an egg donor. And so the couple ends up seeking a sperm donor and having a child that it's genetically connected to the mother. But what happens is the child grows up and longs for the connection with their missing biological parent. And so it is a simply a transference of longing from parent to child. Surrogacy. So the world says surrogacy is a beautiful way to help a couple to have a baby when they can't have their own. Then before us, the children's rights perspective says, up until birth, the surrogate is the only mother that the child knows. Surrogacy intentionally severs that irreplaceable mother-child bond and inflicts a primal wound on the child. When children lose their birth mother through hardship or tragedy, we grieve but intentionally inflicting that wound is an injustice. So surrogacy is never a child-friendly process, even if the child ends up going home with the genetic mother and father. On the day that the child is born, those two genetic parents are just two strangers among seven billion. It's the surrogate's body the baby knows. It's her heart that she's listened to. It's her voice that she recognizes. It's her body that she longs for. That nine and a half months is actually critical foundations for attachment and trust. And so we should never casually separate that or intentionally separate a child from its birth mother. Adult-centric adoption. Uh, the world says, well, we shouldn't discriminate against any adult who wishes to adopt. The children's rights perspective says, no adult has a right to adopt. 
Children who have lost their parents have a right to be adopted and social workers must have the freedom to place children in the homes that will best serve those children. That means because biology matters and gender matters and marriage matters, that when you can find a, a home where the child will have some kind of kinship bond connection, answer uncles or grandparents so they can retain the connection with their first family, those families should be prioritized. Or, and when the couple is married, that brings the stability that children need, those couples should be prioritized. And homes that can offer the maternal and paternal love that children crave, that is a mother and father, those homes should be prioritized. So we'll talk a little more about adoption versus reproductive technologies and draw this out a little bit more. But the bottom line is uh, when people say to me, well, do you think that gays and lesbians have a right to adopt? I say no, because no adult has a right to adopt. I'm an adoptive mom. I didn't have a right to that adopted child. I didn't have a right to my adopted child. He had a right to parents. He was the client, not me. So I wanna spend some time contrasting adoption and um, reproductive technologies because you can and should be a wholehearted supporter of adoption and totally reject children created through third-party reproduction. So first, the first contract is a contrast is that adoption mends a wound. Um, a proper understanding of adoption uh, recognizes that adoption begins with loss for the child. Um, as an adoptive mom, I can say, I am seeking to mend that loss and mend that wound of my adopted son but I will never be able to fully compensate for what he's lost. Um, he has lost something real and precious um, and that's something that he may struggle with for the rest of his life. But the adoptive parents are seeking to mend the wound. They didn't create the wound. They didn't decide that it was, they did not determine that the birth mother should be absent from the child's life. Rather a tragedy or hardship has taken place and the adoptive parents are coming in to seek to mend the wound. In contrast, sperm and egg donation and surrogacy inflicts the wound. The parents or commissioning parents or adults in those arrangements are choosing for the child to lose a relationship with their mother or father or both. Both of them result in a wound. Both of them originate with a wound, adoption and reproductive technologies. But in the case of adoption, the adults are seeking to mend the wound. With third party reproduction, the adults are inflicting the wound. Number two, in adoption, the child is the client. Um, I used to work at one of the largest Chinese adoption agencies in the world. And my founder once said to me, Katie, even though the adults are the ones that are paying us, they are not the client. The child is the client. When adoption is working the way it should, every child that needs a home is going to find parents, but not every adult who wants a child is going to get one. And that is why adoption has so many layers of screening and vetting. When we went through our adoption process, we had to have um, federal background checks, state background checks, references from friends, home studies, training, post-placement supervision, um, clearances from the country that our, our son originated in. Um, but that's not how it works in reproductive technologies. In reproductive technologies, the adults are the client. There's no screening. There's no background checks, even though the adults often go home with a child who is unrelated to them, at least to one of their parents. The only check, the only screening, the only check that has to clear, right, is the bank, is the bank account check. So the adult is the client in reproductive technologies. Um, and the goal of fertility clinics is to get the adults a child no matter the cost. In adoption, the adults support the child. So when children are processing their loss and their wound, which both children who are adopted and children created through sperm and egg donation, they're both going to wonder about their missing parents. They're both going to think about who are my parents? Why did they choose to not be in relationship with me? So the question is, are the parents gonna be able to support their children as they process that loss? In adoption, because the parents did not create the loss, the child is more free to be open open that wound and about the healing that needs to take place. They can honestly say, um, who is my birth family? Or why did they abandon me? 
And oftentimes in the adoption world, the child has contact with their first family and can get those answers directly from them. In sperm and egg donation, the child is living with the adult who is responsible for their loss. And that means that if they were to voice their questions or discuss their genealogical bewilderment or say, I'm struggling to figure out who I am, or I want to know who my father is, or why does he not want to be interested? Why did he sell sperm? Why did she um, choose to sell her eggs? Does she know that I exist? Does she think about me? Do you think that I've passed her on the street already? Which is what many of them are asking themselves, even when they're young. If those kids of sperm and egg donation choose to voice their concerns to their parents, they're talking to the very adult who is responsible for that absent parent. And so what it often means is children created through sperm and egg donation feel that they cannot be honest about the loss and the pain that they experience. So the one study that we have that contrasts children created through adoption or children who have been adopted and children created through third party reproduction shows that even though adoptees are being raised by neither biological parent and children created through sperm and egg donation are related to at least one biological parent, the adoptees fare better than the children created through reproductive technologies. We suggest that that's because they are able to be more open about their pain with their parents because their parents did not inflict the wound. Um, whereas the children created through third party reproduction often have to suffer alone because talking about their pain means indicting the parents that are raising them. And finally, adoption is sometimes necessary. Um, there are tragic situations where parents are lost or must relinquish their child. We do live in a broken world. And adoption is a just society's response to children in need. Sperm and egg donation and surrogacy is never necessary. It may be very wanted on the part of the parent. Um, but what it does is whereas adoption seeks to mend the wound, right? It seeks to care for orphans. Sperm and egg donation and surrogacy creates orphans. It creates children. It intentionally decides that they will be motherless or fatherless or both. And it is never necessary. So what happens is when we prioritize children's rights to their mother and father, we get good policy and we make good personal decisions. So the goal of them before us is to seek to make sure that all conversations about marriage and family revolve around children's rights to their mother and father. Because if you begin there, you will arrive at the proper policy conclusions every time. So what does effective advocacy look like? Um, well, first of all, you, we, need to tell, we need to tell the story. We need to flip the script. Right now, the world says that adults are the victims if they don't get what they want in all of these policy debates. Adults are the victims if they are infertile and they can't use a sperm or egg donor. Adults are the victims if they experience same-sex attraction and cannot um, have the same title of marriage for their relationships. You know, Adults are the victims if they are in a struggling marriage and just need an easy out. And if they can't have a no-fault divorce, um, then they're the ones that have to be in the struggling marriage. I actually did a presentation at a college last night, um, and I talked about the fallout of divorce and how um, children suffer <laughs> Children suffer emotionally, mentally, physically, academically, even in forming their own relationships as a result of a no-fault divorce. And a girl came up to me afterwards and said, you're right, I have suffered all the things that you've talked about, but when people think about the divorce, they only give sympathy to my mother and father, but never to me. Um, children are the real victims in all of the conversations about marriage and family. When we get the answers to these questions wrong, it is children who are the true victims. So when we are talking about these policy discussions, begin with the fact that children are the victims, regardless of how the adults have struggled or suffered, regardless of what they want. If you get these answers wrong, children are going to suffer. So first, we need to highlight the true victims. Second, people in the pro-family world have always had the best research and always had the best statistics but we have lost, we have continued to lose because the other side tells a better story. So we need to start telling the stories of the true victims. 
Um, we seek to do that at Then Before Us on our website, thenbeforeus.com. You're going to find a story bank of children created through reproductive technologies, of children who lost a parent to divorce or abandonment, um, of children who were raised by same-sex parents, talking about really being honest about what their parents who prioritize their own desires above children's rights, what that cost them. Because when you spend some time looking in the faces of these kids, your own heart is changed. So when we advocate for public policy, we first need to lead with the stories of kids and then follow up with the statistics and the research. And finally, we need to be consistent in advocating for the rights of children. Um, we've been ineffective in the past because some pro-family organizations perhaps have gotten defensive when it comes to oh, children of same-sex parents. Um, you know, oh, they suffer so greatly. Well, they do. They struggle from mother hunger, father hunger, the loss of a biological parent, often an instable um, upbringing. But gays and lesbians are not responsible for the abysmal state of the family in America and around the world today. Heterosexuals are responsible for that chiefly with the legal redefinition of marriage in no-fault divorce, with the rise of cohabitation, uh, with the normalization of casual sex. And so we have to be very serious about advocating for all children. We need to expect that all adults will conform to the rights of all children, rather than being uh, selectively outraged about various issues. So at Them Before Us, we say all adults, single or married or gay or straight, must conform to the rights of children. And there are no exceptions for that. I've just briefly touched on some of this, but um, the new book that we have coming out next week has all of the stories that really are very difficult to find because they're very expensive to tell. Um, stories of kids who often have to speak under the guise of anonymity so that they do not upset the family dynamics um, of their family of origin or um, of their upbringing. Um, we've gone through all the studies. We have debunked all of the myths. And so if you want more information, this is the resource. This is the place to get it. Um, but I just want to encourage you. I have seen hearts and minds changed by centering the conversation around children's rights to their mother and father in all matters of marriage and family. Um, and I would encourage you to make that the focus point of your work as well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so, so much, Katie, for your remarkable and uh, refreshing presentation. And uh, uh, actually, it gave us a new refreshing perspective on uh, children's rights. Uh, usually, uh, they are presented like uh, some kind of individualistic rights, which neglects the actual and uh, most important uh, child interests. And uh, your presentation actually uh, was full of good uh, points for public debates and for discussions uh, in order to uh, uh, raise awareness uh, about uh, two child rights. So thank you very much. And uh, we uh, right now finished all our presentations. And um, as I told, we have uh, a time for uh, un questions for discussion for answers uh, again uh, you can uh, uh, ask those answers and at least uh, try to ask those uh, questions not answers and we will uh, try to present that to speakers and I have one question to you Kate it's actually more philosophical <laughs> but uh, for uh, it's uh, not not easy question actually uh, from philosophical point of view, it's better to be than not to be. Even if you are, as a child, uh, if you were conceived uh, not in a natural way, not in the ideal way, but still uh, uh, from ontological point of view, it's better to exist than not to exist. So how you would respond? And uh, actually, those uh, children who were conceived in uh, artificial way of surrogacy, they still have a uh, right to be happy and they are happy that they exist. 
So that's a question that's very often asked of children conceived through sperm and egg donation. Um, well, they, they'll say, you know, it's really hard because I don't look like anybody else in my family. Or, well, I was conceived to a single mother by choice um, and I, I don't have a father um, or somebody that was conceived through sperm donation who's being raised by two moms. Um, and, and they would say, well, I, I desperately long to have a father, you know, like my friends do. Um, oftentimes what people will say is, well, you should just be grateful to be alive. Why aren't you just grateful? To, you wouldn't be alive without this. And what I've heard some of them say is, children of rape can be grateful that they're alive and still be critical of the circumstances of their conception. Um, and that you can look back and say, I recognize that there was some loss that took place around my conception and I can be grateful to be alive and still critique the loss that I experienced because of how my life came about. So a lot of times that um, kind of two things that, that a lot of donor conceived children have to respond to is, well, you should be grateful because you're so loved and wanted. Your parents paid so much money for you. Um, and so that's, and then the other is, well, you should be grateful for your life. That's probably the top two things that children conceived through these technologies um, have to fight against. And it's actually really just a tool to silence them a lot of the time, really. And that, and it's sort of, it's very typical of how the world responds to any child that talks about the loss that they experienced when they were growing up. Children of divorce will um, hear the same thing. Well, you should just be grateful that you have two parents that love you and that you didn't you know, lose one of them. Children created, you know, children who have two moms or two dads, dads often hear, you should be so happy that you're safe and loved. You have two moms that love you so much. And really what all those statements are, what the child hears is, shut up. Your needs, your natural longings, um, your losses, do not, do not outweigh the importance of your parents' personal happiness. Now that's a problem because um, what, what I've noticed in this work is that the adults are supposed to be the ones who are understanding, supportive and accommodating when it comes to the parent-child relationship. But whenever a child loses a relationship with their parent because adult desire is prioritized above children's rights, it's a role reversal. Suddenly, it's the child that's supposed to be supportive, understanding, and accommodating so that the adult can live as they please. And that's exactly opposite. When we honor the rights of children, when we respect their right to their mother and father, and we conform our rights, our lives to their rights, then adults are doing the hard things rather than asking children to do it for us. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, convincing uh, answer. Uh, but I also have one more question, and which I think uh, will be bridged to the uh, points uh, which were raised in uh, Paul Coleman's and uh, Yuri Surydevsky's presentations. Uh, it's uh, concerning um, differentiating uh, different uh, lifestyles or, or let's say family notions. And uh, the advocates uh, of this uh, more liberal view say that we live in pluralistic society. People have different lifestyles, different uh, decisions. And if you will start to speak that uh, some families are more natural, better families, no, more normal families than others, you will hurt children. And actually in Lutaina, we recently had a case when there was on uh, national TV, uh, th there was um, uh, lessons, uh, uh, TV lessons for children who are at home uh, because of quarantine. And uh, they presented that uh, uh, like homosexual lifestyle was uh, the same choice as uh, for children as uh, heterosexual. Uh, there was some letters from public to this um, uh, uh, public broadcaster, and their answer was that we have to be neutral. We don't have we we don't have to discriminate any choices, and we have have to be tolerant to everybody and try that children not to feel bad. So, uh, what could you say? I'm not sure if that's directed to me. I'll speak briefly so that the gentleman can really give you a robust response. Um, but I would say that I believe that in a free society, we should permit adults 
to form consensual relationships, but we should only promote the family that protects the rights of children. And you can do both, you should do both. Um, and when it comes to um, you know, heterosexual, homosexual families, here's, here's a little tip. Anytime you hear the word modern family being used to describe uh, some kind of household arrangement, that's just code for child loss. The child had to lose something to be in that family. Now, sometimes that happens through tragedy and we do the best that we can. But when you're inflicting that loss intentionally, it's an injustice and we need to call it out. Okay, thank you. Perhaps I'll, I'll try to give a short answer if, if possible. Of course, you're right. Okay, I think that, well, uh, first of all, of course, I completely agree that uh, uh, in a free society, uh, people must be free to form uh, various unions without harming others. But I think that here, um, what we have is, uh, is, is one of the plagues of the modern society is, first of all, confusing law uh, and morals and ethics. Uh, what is legal uh, is not necessarily ethical. So people usually do not understand it. Modern people, that's one of the problems, uh, uh, let's say, uh, plaguing the thinking of the modern society. And the second thing is that we have to distinguish between a right and a privilege. And this, again, uh, you have a right to something, but you don't have, not, not necessarily have a privilege. You don't have the right, for instance, to win a Nobel Prize. The same thing is that you have the right to do something, but it does not mean that, a, uh, that, that you have the right to a special uh, privilege of it being supported. Um, <clears throat> let's say, and of course, uh, a, if there is a state, if there is a polity, above the family level, by definition, it cannot be axiologically uh, neutral. Uh, so this axiological neutrality is actually a myth. Uh, it does not exist. Of course, the state, uh, or let's say a, a, a polity, I don't really like the word state because it refers mostly to the modern type Westphalian uh, state, I would say more in a more, uh, you know, in a, in a larger context, a polity. Uh, a polity is, um, or must be um, directed to a common good. But the definition of a common good is by definition um, not neutral. So yes, the fact that, 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 that there is a right uh, to live in such and such a way and that we don't punish some kind of relations as they do, for instance, in the Islamic Republic of uh, Iran, uh, you know, uh, lapidation or, or, or throwing, uh, you know, of uh, uh, skyscrapers. Uh, but yet it does not mean that um, all the, all the uh, forms of cohabitation of, or all the de facto situations which are not legally punishable uh, must have a society's approval. It's as simple as that to me. If I could just add to that, maybe a uh, uh, building on that, really, um, and challenging the idea that we really live in a pluralistic society, um, because that, again, is something of code to say, well, because we live in a pluralistic society, we should um, have all of these different structures, we should welcome them and allow them. But as I was saying in my remarks, there's no real pluralism, there's no real diversity, and there's no real tolerance. And um, once these things are introduced, if you hold a counter view, if you disagree, if you hold to the view that was just before, then you'll find out just how pluralistic, just how um, tolerant the society is. And uh, all of a sudden your views are labeled as bigoted and you are shut out from the debate. And we see this, we see this across all these different European and Western countries, uh, as Eurus said, uh, there is no real neutrality. The state or the polity is always um, promoting or not promoting something or another. And if we take now the month of February, for example, February in the UK and other countries is, is LGBT plus history month. Um, all of our institutions of government have um, their Twitter profiles, their social media profiles adorned with rainbow flags. 
Uh, all of um, sections of, of media uh, are, are promoting this. The BBC Sport website, should be talking about soccer, golf, whatever, has entire sections dedicated to what it's like to be an LGBT plus football fan, for example. It's one of the articles on there. Um, this, is a, this is a publicly funded uh, corporation. It's, uh, it's funded uh, entirely by um, taxpayers. So there is, there is no neutrality. They don't do that. But March isn't the um, Christianity History Month. April isn't the next, uh, the Disability History Month, and so on and so forth. But if it was real pluralism, then maybe we'd have a month for each of these and many other different issues. But we don't. The, the government, the state, the polity is always picking and choosing. And so the idea that it's true pluralism and that there is true neutrality is a total myth. Thank you, Paul, uh, uh, for your intervention. And uh, also, there are a couple of questions from public to you. Uh, and I think it's a bit related to our this current discussion. One question is, uh, should government, to some extent, protect dignity of persons from verbal assaults? Uh, it, I, I understand this question about uh, this, that uh, those persons who choose uh, some uh, personal lifestyle, uh, they don't feel good if somebody says that criticizes them, says that it's sin, it's uh, abominable, and so on. So should government give at least us to us some, uh, to some extent, protection for our personal dignity? I, I mean, thank you for the question. It really comes down to um, how we define these terms and who gets to define these terms and where we draw the line between the things that we're allowed to say and the things that we are prevented in law from saying. And the challenge when trying to uh, create laws um, that protect people from the harm of their dignity, for example, that's impossible, impossible to really accurately define in law. And what it means is, um, others get to decide what harm of dignity is, and then you get punished as a result. And even if you didn't intend to, even if you didn't mean to, even if um, you were speaking motivated out of um, good intentions, if someone says that they feel bad as a result, that's an impossible standard. Uh, I listen with interest to the talks during this conference any number of people could say that any number of these remarks hurt or impacted or violated their dignity, made them feel bad about themselves or their situation. And I don't think we'd want to be in a position where the police are coming around investigating and, um, and criminalizing us for some of these views. So the, the basic answer is no, the government shouldn't be doing that. But that doesn't mean to say that we should be actively going around trying to insult people. Obviously not. We should, and I do, speak civilly um, as best as possible. In, in terms of what we should do in, in criminalizing speech, the, the standard that I argue for consistently would be to criminalize incitement to imminent violence, incitement to, to lawless action. No problem with that, it's a clear legal standard. Um, when you're talking about criminalizing speech that is uh, insulting or hateful or violating people's dignity, that's an impossible standard. And that leads to all of the things that I was talking about before and more and more cases across Europe where these laws uh, are, are used as a weapon to silence those with whom the organs of state disagree. It's, uh, well, we live in an interesting uh, period of civilization. Uh, there are uh, happening many interesting things and uh, among them, uh, uh, the emergence of uh, so-called big tech or new technologies, new social networks, and uh, they have a huge impact on uh, freedom of speech. And as we see uh, right now, we are mainly censored not by government, but by the big tech companies, which has their own policy. And uh, right now, the question what to do, uh, 
uh, have we to leave this to private initiative or should the government step in to protect us, our freedom of speech from the big tech? So what's the next question from public? Oh, thank you. Well, that would be the topic of an entire other conference, I think, because it's, it's fascinating, it's complicated, um, it's very difficult to solve. Um, and let me, I won't give the answer, but let me explain why it's a, a hard question to answer at least. Um, firstly, when it comes to big tech and censorship, we have to recognize that there isn't even, even agreement on, on what the problem is. And so what looks like universal uh, um, discomfort with big technology and bipartisanship on, on left and right concerned about the increasing monopolistic power that big tech have, when you peel it back a layer, you realize that um, half of these people, or perhaps less than half, think there's a problem with big tech because there's too much censorship. And the other half, although probably more like 80, 90%, think the problem with big tech is that they're not censoring speech enough, that they're not pulling enough content off. So when it comes to then regulating these platforms, if you, if you don't even agree on what the problem is, then how are we going to invite the government in to create the, the solution to that problem? So I, I do think that the monopolistic positions these companies hold is, is ludicrous. I think it, it, it can't go on. It is intolerable. Um, and particularly when we're talking about the infrastructure behind these different platforms. I mentioned briefly uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, but the ubiquity of Amazon's cloud-based services across the internet is something that very few people talk about or think about, but we use it all the time. And as I mentioned, we're using Zoom. Zoom uses Amazon servers for this call. And Amazon pulled Parler down with the click of a button. Um, it could do so at any given moment to any given platform. And there's really it's very hard to overcome that. That's only going to increase in the future. So I do think we're going to have to address this problem. I'm just not optimistic about it because we don't really agree on what the problem is. Um, and therefore, finding the solution for it is going to be, is going to be very challenging. But I, I'm committed to working on this, finding a solution. And um, I do think that something's going to have to give because we, we can't carry on like this, but as I say, it's a, it's a, it's a whole nother conference. Well, uh, we hope that you will invite to this conference when you will have an answers. <laughs> it's very, very urgent. And actually part of those persecution for free speech uh, in the name of protection against uh, hate speech is when people use uh, so-called um, uh, concepts or don't agree with some concepts. For example, if uh, somebody says that you are not a uh, real woman or you are not real family and they can be uh, in some countries uh, can be persecuted for hate speech. And the question is for Yuris uh, concerning this, uh, those concepts. You mentioned that uh, uh, European uh, Human Rights Court uh, the, the, the don't provide uh, or hasn't provided uh, definition of family. And in Lithuania, in the Lithuanian public debates and public discourse, there is a popular view that family as such is a fluid concept which cannot and should not be defined legally. Still, there is a question, is there any possibility to provide universal legal definition of family, or at least criteria which could help us to distinguish between family and not family, which could be based on some uh, uh, respected uh, international, let's say, human rights instruments? Hey, um, thank you for this uh, interesting and relevant question. Well, <clears throat> as I already said, uh, uh, the European Court of Human Rights uh, avoids, usually avoids using the term family. Sometimes it uses it in a, like in, in, occasional, um, in an occasional manner, but uh, the key concept that is even codified in Article 8 
of the convention and used by the court in its judgments and decisions is family life because as i said it is uh, hard to uh, let's say on the one hand hard to define what a family is and but family life is unlike a family is not a structure but a link or a relationship and 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 it's something much wider than uh, the boundaries of, uh, of, of, of a family as a structure. To answer your question, well, I can say yes and no. A uh, clear definition, I think certainly, uh, certainly not, because um, there is no clear definition even in the anthropological sense. Uh, but, uh, but, but this lack of clarity, I would say, is rather quantitative than qualitative. Um, as I already uh, showed, I already mentioned a little bit, um, the question is whether uh, grandparents, uh, whether aunts and nephews, uh, siblings, and, 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 and let's say more distant relatives uh, have to be included uh, in the family or not. Um, also, um, uh, for, for example, in classical Roman law, uh, I, I would remind everybody that the term familia uh, hence the English word family, meant something much wider than um, family <clears throat> as we usually understand it, like a nuclear family and closest relatives, because it encompassed slaves, the entire household. But there was no separate word for what we know as a nuclear family. So uh, in, 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 my, in my, my mother tongue, for instance, in Latvia, there are two words, uh, gimene, uh, which means family as in, in a narrowest sense, meaning a nuclear family and grandparents, siblings, and saime, uh, which is a little, a little bit archaic, but meaning uh, like a family in a larger sense, uh, sometimes including agricultural, uh, you know, sharecroppers or, 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 or whatever. Uh, however, uh, if we speak of not of definition but of providing some guidelines some criteria yes uh, some of them can be found in um, international human rights instruments and first and foremost of course in the uh, uh, universal declaration of human rights promulgated by the united nations uh, in uh, 1948 and in, in, this, in this document, uh, if you look at Article 16 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is said that it encompasses both foundation of, of, of a family and, uh, and uh, as a marriage and a family as a, as a concept. Uh, paragraph one of Article 16 says, men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality or religion have the right to marry and to found a family. They are entitled to equal rights as to marriage. And then the second paragraph um, speaks of uh, free consent. And the third, the third paragraph of the same article says that the family is a natural and fundamental group unit of society as an entitled to protection by society and the state. So here we have already three indications. The first is that unlike in most uh, or all the other uh, human rights uh, provisions, uh, the subject, the primary subject of this right is not an individual, but men and women, meaning a couple. So you cannot marry being alone, of course, uh, that's logical. Then the second point is the um, use of and, to marry and to found a family. It is not to marry or to found a family. So foundation of a family is a, a consequence of a marriage. And then the third paragraph of the same article, because sometimes and well, quite often, um, if we apply what is known in continental law as systemic interpretation, how articles are divided and how they are structured, it matters. It says that the family is a natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. The same logic has been later reproduced in Article 12 of uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, again, men and women uh, uh, have the right to marry and, and, and found a family. And in Article 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which also which says that 
A, so the structure has been inversed. The family is a natural and fundamental group unit of society. And then the second, the second paragraph is the right of men and women of marriageable age to marry and found a family shall be recognized. So here we have, we have, you know, again, we have a marriage as a consequence, uh, sorry, a family as a consequence of marriage. And of course, uh, uh, at the moment when these provisions were drafted, especially in 1948, nobody could ever imagine that it could apply to you know, same-sex couples. And if we look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the, uh, so paragraph one of article 16, it said that men and women of full age without any limitation due to race, nationality, or religion have the right to marry. And here, if we apply the mischief rule of interpretation, we immediately see where is the, the, the crux of this, of this provision. Uh, in fact, we must also remember that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted um, by a group of experts among whom were two um, important personalities. One of them was a uh, uh, French uh, Catholic uh, philosopher Jacques Maritain, and the second was a um, was a, a Lebanese Lebanese Christian statesman Charles Malik, and this provision, and by the way, this was highlighted by the former British judge, Sir Gerald Fitzmaurice, in the early judgment, judgments of the, uh, of the European Court of Human Rights in the 1970s. Uh, he actually highlighted this, that this provision, this kind of provisions, where uh, they had been um, drafted and adopted in order to prevent what had happened during the war, you know, the Nuremberg laws, which prevented, let's say, Jews from marrying non-Jews, Jews, Jews so, so-called Aryans. So you see me immediately without any limitation to, due to race, nationality, or religion. So, but we see here that there is a clear systemic structural link between a marriage and the foundation of a family. And I think that if we look at it through a, uh, an Aristotelian lens and we apply a healthy distinction between uh, between um, act or actuality and potency, we can say that in fact family is a structure, the seed of which, let's say, the kernel of which, the core of which, is uh, a marriage between a man and a woman and their children, and. And all the rest goes around in concentric circles. Now there can be, for instance, a couple without children or a, a, a single mother. It is a family, but for actually, so imagine that there is a single mother, there is no father, but the father is meant to be there. So that's the idea. So potentially the father is meant to be there. So actually there is a, let's say a loss or a defect. It's a very, let's say politically incorrect word, but potentially there is always as an ideal, a, uh, a couple of a, a, a man and a woman. And here I can only refer you to the very famous statement made by Aristotle in chapter one of his politics, that the nature of everything is its, uh, its, its fulfillment. So this word is not uh, he, 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 let's say has different defects, but the ideal, let's say potentially there is a, a, a man, a woman uh, and their children. And um, the last thing uh, that I wanted to say, uh, it is uh, here, I mean, what comes to my mind is that, um, for instance, in a family where they, 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 for instance, there's a single mother, there is no father. Uh, in the early Christian communities, uh, during the first uh, centuries of Christianity, there was a very laudable and, and, and famous and noble uh, tradition, a uh, custom of having one seat at the head of the table free, uh, like Christ is with us. He's like sitting at the same table. He's not physically here, but we have one place reserved for our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way, there is, let's say, at least at the level of potentiality, a place, let's say, for a missing parent. But as I said, the core is mother, father, and their children. So I hope that I have answered this question. Yeah. 
very much Yuris for a beautiful and comprehensive answer. Unfortunately, uh, every good thing that this world should uh, have the end, but I still would like to ask if uh, Kate and Paul maybe have some brief uh, uh, remark for the end of the discussion. Would you like something to add, please? Well, I will just say that as you all know, nobody's gonna do this for you. Uh, your government probably, I don't know um, if they have the political courage to do it. Um, here in the education system, it's working against us. No celebrities are gonna speak out on this topic. Um, big business, big tech, big fertility um, is all aligned against um, children's rights and the natural family that it should result in. And so you must be courageous and you must become the experts. And you have to be prepared to answer all of these questions uh, because you probably are going to be the only source of, um, you're going to be the resistance. And so you need to do it well. Um, that means being fully equipped, being familiar with the stories of the children who are the true victims in all of these conversations, and then being discerning but bold about speaking up. Um, this is your chance. You know, This is your chance to, to stand firm on the rights of children and defend them. Thank you for inspiration and encouragement and uh, Paul. No, I, I say nothing further because that ought to be the last word. So thank you very much. So thank you all of you very much. And uh, we really appreciate uh, your time and your being with us and sharing uh, and for Lithuanian public, your insights and your explanations and uh, suggestions are very valuable because we uh, definitely will use them uh, in our public discussions and I think they will also provide for policymakers better understanding how to make a wise choices which uh, provides for better future for all of us. So thank you again, uh, uh, you, uh, Dr. Yuris Radevskis, Katie Faust and Paul Coleman for being with us. And now I will switch to Lithuanian. I would also like to thank everybody else who joined us, who were listening to this conference and who asked questions. Well, our speakers did not have an opportunity to answer all of your questions, but your presence was very important. And uh, the Free Society Institute hopes that uh, this conference uh, gave you good insights and suggestions that uh, can be used in public discussions um, to make sure that um, we are able to create a better state in Lithuania and a better future for all of us. I would like to thank all of you. And the speaker kindly thanks the interpreters who faced uh, quite challenges in interpreting these highly intellectual and sophisticated speeches. Uh, so thank you to the technical center who helped with the broadcast and thank you the parliamentary group for family which was the patron of this conference thank you to madam vilia abramikiene as i said uh, you will be able to find all the presentations on the website soon if you miss something or if you want to have have a closer look at the presentations so you'll have an opportunity to do so so thank you very much once again and goodbye